Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Noman live stream. And thanks for joining us for tonight's event, uh, 2D and 3D animation, a blender breakdown with Jason Michael Hall. Uh, my name is Adam Hartel, and I'm your host this evening. And it's my honor to introduce our guest this evening. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to take care of a couple things. The first thing I'd like to do is to thank Lenovo, powered by AMD, for sponsoring uh, this event. Lenovo helps us to continue to bring free educational events to you. Uh, additionally, this live stream is going to be added to our stream catalog and will be available to watch on our Twitch and YouTube channels uh, in vi as video on demand after the event concludes. Um, our events, inc including this stream, are available with closed captioning via Facebook Live. Uh, so if you're in need of any uh, closed captioning today, uh, you can uh, follow a link that my colleague will drop in the chat uh, to head over to our Facebook Live feed uh, where you can get that service. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to introduce our guest, uh, Jason Michael Hall, uh, who is a pre-visualization artist, uh, arrived in Los Angeles in 2006, having been accepted to the Noman School of Visual Effects for our certificate program. Uh, Noman gave him a solid foundation as a CG, CG generalist, which has led to a successful 14-year career in film and animation, primarily in pre-visualization and layout. Uh, during that time, he has been creating amazing action sequences on many of the top big budget visual effects films of the last decade, including J.J. Uh, Abrams' uh, Star Trek, Zack Snyder's Justice League, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Transformers, SpongeBob SquarePants, Sonic the Hedgehog, X-Men, and Deadpool. And in addition to working in previs, uh, Jason has also contributed in areas like concept design, storyboarding, animatics, as well as teaching character design and pre-visualization at Nomen. Uh, and with that, I'd like to say, Jason, welcome back to the stream. It's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> nice. That's, that, that, was, that was spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, don't don't adjust your monitors, guys. Jason and I are not twins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I intentionally didn't wear a plaid shirt this evening just so as not to confuse the audience. Um, I'm his Ireland doing, doppelganger. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you good. doing well? Yeah, I'm great. Looking it's good to have to you back. Doing some Blender again with you. We had a good time last time. So. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, you're going to be showing us um, a really cool project that you've been working on. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not going to steal any thunder from you. I'm not even going to say the title of it. I'm going to let you do all of that part. Um, but this is a really, really cool uh, animated, kind of a, a short animated film you're working on, right, in Blender? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very it's, cool. It or, or originated years ago as kind of a catch-all for all my experiments and projects for just stuff I was working on at home in my free time until it developed into kind of a series I was trying to pitch, an animated series, which it still is, but, you know, it's it's hard to get a TV series, especially an animated series, pitched. So in the meantime, just in my own time, especially discovering Blender, I'm basically doing everything myself and just going to put a short together because I'm tired of waiting and pitching it. I just want to get something done and out there, you know? Absolutely. So, and like Blender makes it so easy now. <laughs> it's crazy. So Yeah, very cool. Um, well, hey, I'm going to hop in the sidecar. The mic and the floor are yours. Uh, so you just take cool. us in, start showing us around, and I will uh, raise some questions uh, from the chat this evening. So if you got some questions you want to ask Jason, just feel free to type them right into the chat um, in the moment in context with what he's talking about. Um, and we're also going to keep a backlog of the questions that have come in that we haven't gotten to and see how many we can address at the end of our time. So uh, go for it, guys. And uh, yeah, Jason, the floor is yours. OK, cool. Yeah, and just uh, like you said, the, the animated short is called, well, the series was called The Last Secret Agent Man. It's like a futuristic sci-fi uh, secret agent spoof, basically. And um, what the short I'm doing is based it's kind of a way to introduce some of the main characters through a music video. And the music video is based on a fictional band that appears in, in the show. There's this rockabilly bar that a lot of stuff takes place in, in this rockabilly gang. And there's a band in there called the Pomades that's always playing. So I've, I've written music for the Pomades to play, and they're sort of like the background score of the show. And so this is going to be basically a music video for the Pomades. And during it, it sort of introduces some of the main characters. Wait, from the wait, show. wait a minute. Let's break down really quick um, <laughs> all the different roles that you have fulfilled in the making of this, because I think this is this is pretty profound, and it's kind of yeah. showcases how great of a, a tool Blender can be as well. Yeah, I 
Uh, well, like if I did the if I had the end credits, it'd be like one of those cheesy ones where they say drawn, right, yeah. designed by Jason, music by Jason, uh, written by Jason. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've I've kind of like I'm I'm doing the music, I'm doing the animation, I've done all the character design, like everything I've built from scratch. Like I'm barely even using any pre-made assets and stuff for it, and I'm using very cool so many different roles that fit into my. I make, I've worked for 14 years with Maya and 3D, but I, a lot of the tools I'm using come from my drawing foundation that I had, that I learned earlier in life, like when I was trying to be a comic book artist and just learning mm-hmm. to illustrate and all that. Because yeah. I, you know, I spent most of my 20s wanting to draw comics, and of course, this is going to give me my, my age a bit, but um, when I was trying to break in in my 20s is when it was right after the whole image comics boom head bust and like everybody mm-hmm. was going out of business. Marvel was bankrupt. And you know, I, I would go to comic con and show my work and I'd get some interest from editors and I'd get all excited and I'd go home and get in touch with them. I'd find out they'd been laid off. You know? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't that great to do it at the time. I'm not fooling myself, but uh, every time I would get a little nibble, it seemed like they would go away. I was like, Oh, there's just, everyone was just losing jobs left and right. It was a rough time. So, but it led me to getting into animation and visual effects, which I think was better in the long run anyway. Because at the time, I'm not sure I had the discipline to be a monthly comic book artist. That's a lot of work. <laughs> well, now you're getting to bring your original love of that back into this this skill set that you have now. Yeah, um, I always thought comics yeah. would lead me to movies, but movies led me back to comics and, and, and animation awesome. like this. So, <laughs> Cool. Well, I can't um, wait to see this thing. Yeah, so yeah, this what I have here I'll show you guys is just a, um, a little bit of a sizzle reel. Um, it's kind of an animatic of the short, but it's some of it's just kind of nonsense, like placeholder pieces, um, just to give you an overall vibe of it with um, with the backing music that it'll have. So, um, with that said, I'll just show it to you, and it'll show a lot of the elements that I have and a lot of the stuff I'm going to try to break down today to show you how it works. Nice. So, uh, let's see. Two seconds, and I'll get it playing. All right, here we go.
Very cool. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for watching. See you guys later. That was the short. <laughs> Mic drop. Yeah. No, that was great, man. You've you've done a, you've added a lot more since I last saw it, and you like got all those storyboarding elements you put in as well. Yeah, yeah. I've got about probably like forty five minutes of storyboards I've done over the last couple of years as I keep mm -hmm. changing the ideas too. So those are the parts that have remained, and yeah, mixed in with a lot of it's just placeholders or shots I've started and stuff. Um, because a lot of it's just been approaching where I'm just throwing stuff in, like blocks and moving them through the scene. There's not really shots to show yet. Like now that I was kind of waiting on some stuff, like I just, I have one of those Rococo smart suits now for motion capture, which is what I was going to do a lot of the animation with, which uh, if we have time, I can kind of show you how it, uh, how I can apply it to the characters really fast in Blender too today. Because wow. um, I mean, I was, I like to animate traditionally as well. Um, but I found quickly that if I want to, I want to try to finish the short before the end of the year, especially before we're all back working in the office full time and you have less time to work on personal mm -hmm. projects. And uh, if I want to finish, finish this before like 2027, 20, then I should probably use some motion capture to save me some animation time. <laughs> yeah. So I'm basically doing motion capture animation and I'm using um, uh, the NLA, the nonlinear animation uh, editor in, uh, Blender, which I'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of works like uh, animation layers in um, in Maya, if anyone's familiar with those. So, And so I can just do that to add a layer of animation on top of what I captured just to kind of add some exaggeration and some squash and stretch and things like that. So Very cool. So what, you have the you have the smart suit on right now? Like, is it you're wearing it under your shirt <laughs> <I don't laughs> <have it>. right <laughs> now? Or? Well, actually, I wanted to, I was possibly going to try to get it set up because it has a plugin that'll work live in Blender. So you can just plug oh my in gosh, your character so cool. and that's animate great. real time with it. But I couldn't, I didn't have the time to get it set up solid enough that I could demo with it today without well, you have enough <laughs> cool stuff to show us already. So yeah. No yeah. There. yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I will show you, um, I guess we can uh, dive into it here and nice. I'll, I'll kind of go through everything as quick as I can. It's nice. We have a little more time, but uh, it's mm -hmm. still probably going to go super fast. So. Um, but yeah, so I'll show you like if, if any of you saw, there was like this big shot at the beginning where the guy's just kind of walking through the city and he walks like into the bar where they're all, the band is playing and stuff, which is kind of like one of the big intro shots to introduce the environment, which um, most of the stuff I do here is, is real time. And when I say real time, I'm actually starting to push the limits of what is real time, but I still consider it somewhat real time because it's real time enough that I can't necessarily scrub through real time without any lag if I'm going through the, like, this is kind of the scene that was playing and, you know, you can see it scrubs really heavy when it's actually moving. So that's kind of tough. But the advantage is I can see all the lights are on, all the textures are done, full res, all the lighting and shadows, and I can dolly around the scene really easy too and really light. And I mean, this scene is super heavy. Like I have, um, here, I'll turn off the lights real quick. Or, so you can oh, see wow. I have this whole, like basically this area of the story is taking place. Um, this is totally original, but it's a giant metropolis. And that's never happened in sci-fi, I know. Never. <laughs> never. It's like a fifth element style <laughs> size city that takes up the entire West Coast. And it's so dense that you never really see the ground. And um, most of the living, it's, it's more of a utopian living in it. They live up on the upper area where you can actually see the sky sometimes, but way down deep in the city, there's these pockets where these, these little grungy towns, which mm -hmm. is where this is taking place. And then you can see it's kind of surrounded by the city all around. Um, and, you know, I have these two buildings here and I have, you know, this will be like the marketplace in here, which I have some other pieces I'll show you later. Like there's a ramen restaurant I built. And then you can even go all the way into the club here where I have the entire crowd going and the band cool. playing as well as, whoops. Yeah, get back to the stick. Sorry. Hang on. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Click the wrong thing. But, uh, dang it. <laughs> All right, there we go. Bring this back over. There you go. Yeah, so you can zoom in and see the whole band playing and stuff, too. So yeah. it's really nice to be able to just, even if you can't watch your real-time animation 
you can at least get all your scenes set up to look how you want it to and you know compose all your shots and you know even if you need to work on the animation in here too you can still do that because you can pick like your character here and um, if you just have like the basis guy here and you just hit slash and it'll show you just him if you go and select the objects and then you say slash then you have him by himself and then you can kind of scrub through you know, I don't have animation on in this scene right now, but um, you know, if he was animating, you could be scrubbing through and he'd be dancing around and stuff, and it would pretty much play real time. So, um, now the, did you set up these rigs that. from scratch? The like the rig that I'm seeing around him right now, or uh, these are this is an auto rigger I've used. So Blender mm -hmm. comes with a really good auto rigger that has full body and even a facial rig called Rigify, um, mm -hmm. and it comes mm -hmm. native and it's pretty solid too. Um, and I used that for a while. And um, I've actually recently re-rigged these guys because I'm actually using one called Auto Rig Pro now, which it was just a little more flexible for the stuff I'm doing. And, um, and I, I use a program called Character Creator to create some of my characters now because um, you can uh, you can export your. It works kind of like like a video game character creator where you can use sliders to like change the shape of their faces and their proportions and everything. Mm -hmm. But the advantage uh, is it has a go Z feature. So it'll send it to ZBrush and I can sculpt all my crazy, really crazy proportions like tiny legs and giant torsos and stuff um, in ZBrush. And then you hit the go Z back and it puts it back into character creator and it's still rigged with a face with all the blend shapes for facial rigging because I wanted to do some motion capture for facial mocap with uh, like an iPhone app, but mm -hmm. you can't, none of the facial capture things I could find work with an actual face rig. It all had to be the blend shape set up. And I didn't have, you know, much like the tradition, the straight ahead animation, I couldn't sculpt all the blend shapes on every face of every character. So, <laughs> um, so this, the character creator actually has all those blend shapes set up. And um, I use another Reillusion makes character creator. And then after that, I can use Reillusion's iPhone app to um, record the facial mocap and then just import it in here and apply it to any of the characters. So I've heard really good things about Character Creator. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Um, it's like their software's you know like the way it loads and everything is a little clunky, but the features in it are amazing and they work great. Um, and yeah, it's just uh, I wanted to actually try to sculpt the whole character and bring it in, but that it is a little clunky and slow sometimes, so I didn't really trust it to do here. But um, I'll show you kind of what the characters look like when I bring them in from there. Sure. But it's great because you can sculpt it in ZBrush and do whatever you want for these crazy stylized characters and then bring it back and it's fully... And you can bring it in with AutoRig Pro and re-rig it. You just snap all the bones to it automatically and set it to rig, and then it lines up perfectly. So you don't have to do all this weird skinning or finding out the right angles for laying out your bones to get the rotations correct and all that complicated rigging stuff. Because... Mm -hmm. As a CG generalist that graduated from Noman, the thing I learned most is the thing I hate the most, and that's rigging and skinning. So I'll leave that to the people who love it. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, yeah, so this was just kind of to show you a lot of the elements I'm using together. So a lot of it's based on my art style, which was like comic book art, and that's kind of what I wanted my series to look like. You know, there's stuff like anime where they'll, they're starting to use like 3D characters and 3D hard surfaces. And some of them look better than others, but a lot of them, they still use this sort of 3D shading on it. And it's still yeah. 3D to me, and I don't like it. And I like just, you know, straight up animation, which is pretty much, I mean, I, I don't know if they just don't realize it, but a lot of the time 3D and animation, it's still shaded with multiple layers of colors, even if it's hard layers. But straight like old-fashioned animation is just flats with like mm -hmm. one shadow layer pretty much and sometimes when they get real fancy or expensive they'll add a rim light or something you know mm -hmm. and so that's kind of what i try to keep all my characters like it's literally just flats with hand-drawn stuff and then one in you know, just the shadow pretty much and then you know it's you don't have to see all the little divots and stuff that you have in the 3d model which can make it easier to model sometimes too because you don't have to mm -hmm. put all that stuff in you're drawing it um so, and then, you know, of course, you can't, you know, part of what we talked about in our last talk, too, and what some people might here might be to see, too, is you don't have to be a 3D modeler or a rigger or all this, you know, advanced 3D software stuff in order to get your artwork into Geo, too, or into Blender as well. You can just use your own traditional artwork you 
draw on Photoshop and get it in here, or you can work in Blender with Grease Pencil, which works a lot like Photoshop. Um, <clears throat> like here, this is just, you know, if you learned a little bit of basic rigging, you can do some pretty crazy things, which I did here. I just have real basic bones. And, you know, I'm just kind of brushing over to it. I'll show you some more details on these. But um, I just have real basic bones on some of these characters. And if you go in here, it just helps you rotate it so you can kind of make them dance. It works great for, like, background characters. It wouldn't be a main character, of course. But that's mm -hmm. what you do all the kind of more heavy-duty stuff on or do it in traditional animation. So... Um, you drew, did you draw all these the these cards here? Did you draw all the two D stuff in grease pencil? Well, these are actually all drawn in Photoshop. So the thing okay. that's cool about this is you can just export these from Photoshop as an alpha, and then mm -hmm. bring it in to Blender as a card. And um, and then it'll the thing about Blender is if you have a transparency on just a card, like a flat card with your character, you can turn on. Um, it's called, sorry, one sec here, turn on close mode, just so I can tell you the exact name of it. It's the uh, alpha clip, which will make the shadows take the same shape as the uh, the shape in there. I don't know if I'll be able to oh, see nice. it. You can kind of see it here. Yeah. yeah so it's like, instead of just showing a, a cube, which is the shape of their actual geometry, the card, uh -huh. it's actually showing what the alpha is. So it's their body shape. That's on great. The and then as you... If you take this and animate one of the characters, you'll see there. Oh, it's getting a little heavy now. Oh, of course, I pick one where you can't see their shadow. So let me do this one. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, and it'll. Awesome. So you know, and especially in the background, when you get a bunch of them lined up like this, it can look really good and realistic sometimes. So you get so much free animation out of that. Mm -hmm. Um. So. That said, and then so as I so there's that, and then there's my fully 3D characters, of course, like I was talking about here, which are these guys, which I just kind of try to text hand texture, which you also can do in Blender. You can just basically draw on your character like drawing on a canvas. Um, it works a lot like Photoshop. You can you have like pressure sensitivity um, with your Wacom pen and everything, and um, you can do that. And then if you don't want to do that, you can just go straight traditional animation and draw with grease pencil, which are all these characters, which I don't necessarily know the actual background, like, you know, under the hood stuff of what grease pencil is, but it, the way it works is a lot like vector graphics. Okay. And it's, it's done like strokes in Blender and you can animate it. So... And that's what all these characters are. There's a couple drawbacks to it, though. Um, it doesn't cast... Sh it takes light now, but it doesn't cast shadows like the cards or 3D objects do. But it does have... And you can get into some issues here when you're working in a 3D environment with a 3D camera like this. It has some add-ons for Grease Pencil that will let you do a drop shadow and stuff. But it doesn't really work in a 3D environment. It's more if you're in a 2D um, surface, it'll actually look like it's dropping a shadow behind it. But... Um, yeah, I won't get too into detail. That's all stuff I'm going to show you over the next uh, sure. few minutes here. So, well, and while you're on the subject, we had a question come in. Someone wanted to know uh, just what what would you say would kind of be the basic tech requirements for taking advantage of the Blender tools and Grease Pencil to kind of do the stuff that you're doing? Uh, tech stuff as far as like how fast of a computer? Yeah, system requirements and yeah, to be able I mean, to get up and running with it. It depends how far you want to go with it. You don't need much um, like this. I have a, you know, this is a pretty beefy computer. I upgraded specifically to do my short last summer. This has a GTX 3090, so that's how it's um, running this heavy scene, you know. Mm -hmm. sure. But if you didn't want to run this and you wanted to just like say you just want to do traditional animation um, in it, you could actually open it up and it would work just fine on a much slower computer and it would work okay, cool. pretty nicely. So yeah. especially with grease pencil, it tends to be pretty light. Like, so this is my lineup of grease pencil characters and, um, oops, zoom in on here. so yeah, and it's, I mean, it's still just cards. So it's really, it's really light on the system as you move mm -hmm. around and move them around. So it wouldn't take much. And you know, if you're doing traditionals, you know, animation like this, and depending on how elaborate you want to get with it, you could just draw your backgrounds and keep it all flat and just pop them on top of it and draw in there. Kind of use the this, parallax of, of the scene and stuff to... Yeah, because you yeah. can go into Blender, like if you open a new Blender here, when you open it, you can go straight to 2D animation feature here, which will bring okay. you in. 
And what it'll do is it'll open a flat canvas, and you can literally just start drawing in it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and there, people are, including you, of course, so people are making some really cool stuff using just this feature alone. Yeah, um, there's the a um, there's a short that the Blender people made themselves called Hero that I would recommend mm -hmm. checking out. That's all kind of well, it's all done traditional animation style, but drawn in Blender in the three D space. So, but you know, you can see here if you draw some loops and stuff like this, this is nothing, but and it's like a flat camera here, and down here you have options, you know, to draw your keyframes. But um, if you click out of the camera, you can see now how it works in a 3D space. Hopefully that's mm -hmm. not too light for you all to see here. But um, That's coming through. Yeah, so, so you can kind of see how it's on a card. And then once you have that, you can leave your draw mode here, and you can start just dragging it around the scene wherever you want to put it, too. So If I understand correctly... Um... Was it just was it just the Photoshop cards you brought in the alphas, or do, can you get the grease pencil stuff also to cast shadows? Uh, the grease pencil won't cast shadows. That's one okay. of the drawbacks. I mean, that's something I know people have requested. Maybe it's coming up sure. and it'll work, or maybe with Blender, you know, 3.0 it might work. I'm actually a couple versions behind on Blender too because I'm knee deep into my short and I don't want any of my tools to break or change. So because I've got my rhythm going, so I'm sure, just yeah, it, you know, so. yeah. Don't if it's not broke, um, don't try to fix it. Yeah, it's still um, in the blend. I think it's Blender 2.92 I'm using. So mm -hmm. um, well, that's so the cool thing about the Blender community is there's so it's you know it's so open source. People are constantly developing. So if it's if it's yeah. a needed thing, it's only a matter of time. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of yeah. They they really they put out releases hot and fast too. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I will show you here real quick um, just a couple options you can do for getting your characters in. So like this is what I was showing you in there. I have the characters on these cards. So one of the great things, if you just want to bring in your characters from Photoshop, for example, you could delete, you could save out your image as an alpha, either as like a PNG or a TIFF file. And one of the godsend additions to... Uh, Blender of recent times is the Images as Planes plugin. Um, so if you go here, you just do that and you navigate to where whatever your alpha thing is that has your artwork on it, and you bring it in, and it'll bring it in already on a card, already with the shader set up for wow. you already, like this. So it already has the alpha set up and everything, and you're ready to go. That's cool. And um, just there. Oops, wrong way. God, there we go. I forgot. Sometimes the when I import things, it's a different. Like I get a little screwed up sometimes because with my hotkeys and just act the right axes because mm -hmm. I work Maya all day and Y is the up axis, and um, it's different hotkeys for yeah uh, move, rotate, and scale. And uh, in Blender, Z is up, <laughs> and uh, the hotkeys are different for move, rotate, and scale. And Sometimes when you import some other objects, it'll come in as the Y up. You can change that, but I'm kind of lazy about checking that, so I just bring it in, and then I have objects that are Y up, and I'm hitting the wrong key. Yeah. That's um, kind of par for the course when you're jumping between different software. Yeah. So, um, yeah, these things, to get through this real quick, is a cool way if you just want to, you know, even if you just have some cool comic, you know, like if you're making, like, but they used to do motion comics or something where the you, know, you can bring in your comic book illustrations and make them slightly move, kind of to just add a little bit of um, entertainment to with the narration. Is uh, these so? If I have you know this character for example, how I break it down. If you look at the geometry, so this is how it looks with the rig. It's just it's like five bones. It's really simple, and uh, she's moving around like this. You can kind of move her hand, you know, get it going, yeah. and. Um, the geometry is super simple. It's just this. It's like, you know, I think 12 polygons total. So that's another thing if you're asking about what kind of equipment you'll need. I mean, 12 polygons is nothing. So any computer is going to be able to run this. And um, you can almost build a crowd with this, like us, like this. You know, I drew like a whole two rows of characters, and now I can split them all up and rig them up real easy. 
and it's not going to drag the system at all. So, and what I was kind of doing with these is I actually have two more versions of these where I went into Photoshop and I changed their clothing colors mm -hmm. and then I just bring them in and I bring two more sets of these in and I put them all in the crowd. And then when they're dancing in the crowd, once I have the shots with the lighting and the volumetric fog and stuff, you won't be able to tell that they're That's all great. the same person. So, um, so yeah, the way you could break that down really easy is, you know, if you have, So you zoom in on this here, you can take one of these characters and just go and do some real simple editing to start and just cut one of the characters out. So I'll just do a real simple one here so it won't take too much time. But you kind of just cut it up close mm -hmm. by and go get it near their head. So first I'm just going to cut out the first main part of their body before I get more into details. Um, go. Alright, so once we have that, I'm going to go ahead and delete the rest of the characters just for now. Alright, so then we just have her. And now we can cut it a little more detailed for the parts we want to move. Like, you know, actually, maybe I'll trim it just a little bit closer here. Come on. Get the edges there. That'll work better. And then what you want to do is try to get a little bit closer to their profile because it's going to be moving around. It'll just make it easier to see later for what parts you want to animate. So I'm just going to kind of use the knife tool here to go through, cut her out there, that's probably good. And some of this might be overkill, you you know, depending on how detailed you want to get with your animation, you don't necessarily have to do all this. Um, but yeah, so get rid of those other couple of shapes. Oh, oops, gotta cut out her shoes too, so there we go. All right, those done. Just a couple more. All right, so once you have that, you're almost there. All you need is just a couple more cuts, which might be if you want the head to move, then I'll just put a couple cuts across there. And basically wherever you want to have a little axis for them to move around. Um, so you can maybe cut out her waist here to work and maybe if you wanted to have even like a little bit lower you know that's like her hips and then her waist and even if your knees if you wanted to go that far and then you're pretty much there i usually put a couple cuts here for the neck just so that it's easier to move the head free from the rest of the body mm -hmm. and um so yeah once you have it kind of see it's just real simple geo there's not much to it really light and this is you know this is something that might be you know it's getting a little bit into the weeds of more complex blender stuff of having to learn to rig but it's pretty easy if you just kind of learn some you know just learn how to add a simple bone you don't really have to know much about rigging in general like if um mm -hmm. let me just uh there we go. Right in the middle, I'll show you. Get rid of all these people. Of course. Hide, hide. Okay. Then, because all you really have to do is once you have it here, you, if you just go, sh oh, let me turn on this too so you guys can see what I'm clicking. Sometimes I forget to turn that on, so be able to see in the corner here some of the keys I hit. So um, all you do is do a shift A, which will let you add a um, armature, which is the you know, um, bone system. So what you want to do is kind of where you put your cuts. If you have your first bone here, you go into object mode and you pick the first bone, drag it down to maybe the knees here. And then uh, all you have to do is hit E to extrude and then the axis you want to go in, which is kind of how uh, blender moves things around you kind of mm -hmm. 
hit move and then the axis, which is kind of cool. You don't actually have to use the little, um, you could use this thing to move it around, but you don't necessarily have to. You can just hit extrude and then Z, and then it'll let you drag it straight up in the Z axis again. So you have one on the waist there, then extrude again up to the shoulders. And then uh, I'll extrude one more for a piece of the neck. And then extrude one more for the top of the head. And then that's it. And you hit tab and you're done. And the thing is, <clears throat> that's almost all you need. So now you can pick your card, which is your technically your geo, and the armature and go under object and say parent and use automatic weights. And it does it all. It's basically an apparent under the bones and skin it for you put the weights under it and just like that it's done and you can go and go into pose mode and there you go she's moving around so, <laughs> so yeah and then uh you know like i was showing in the other ones you know if people have their arms out you can add geo to that because once you go in there you know, if i undo this well she doesn't have arms out but you can um if you go in and pick your geo you could just do that to test it and then undo the skinning. And then if you want to add like arms or other body parts, you can just say extrude again and bring it out in the X axis, Z, and then extrude it down on Z. And, you know, you can add just more like that. I mean, it's kind of tough if you're drawing your artwork, if you're going to have any limbs move around, don't have them touching the body. So it's easier because all you have to do is go in your geo and put cuts in between to cut the arms out and then so that it can move separately from the rest. Mm -hmm. so. And then you have it. It's just that easy to put it in there. So, and then before you know it, you have your, your crowd people club, which is, oops, uh, oops, uh, down here. There we go. I'm just going to undo and bring them all back because I hit them. Ah, and the textures are broken. Oh, well. <laughs> I'll show you in here. But, um, yeah, but that's how you end up with all these people in there. And that's basically how I set all of them up. So. Well, it looks really good. I mean, yeah. you think about the fact that you're just you just got some basic 2D images that are all scattered in there, doing really minimal movement. Um, yeah. As a background element, it looks great. Yeah, and then once you go, like, if I scroll through, I think you can kind of see them. I turn off the lights. They kind of move, but it's pretty heavy. <laughs> turn off some of the lights if it looks any better. But you can kind of see them moving in there, and you can see where all the bones are. And it's literally, yeah, mm -hmm. like this guy here. I come out. I just put like an extra bone for the arm, and then once you have it, you can just rotate it around. You know, just have it go. That's wild. Then, That's great. So, um, yeah, and then you just keyframe it, and you can have it. And the thing is, you can keyframe it, and then duplicate it, and then offset the keyframes, and then you have two people going off motion celebrating. So. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's a really low res way to get your artwork in. And then aside from that, you also have a grease pencil. Now, quick question about what you just showed us. Um, yeah. uh, so from what I understand, I mean, once you learn the basics of how to get around and do things in Blender, really we're just, we're talking about um, a real minimal um, understanding of how to rig in Blender to be able to rig up those 2D images. Yeah. Uh, and get yeah. that to work. Yeah. So it's not yeah, like actually, you have to learn everything there is to know about Blender to be able to do the things that you're showing us. Yeah, all you really have to know to rig those characters is um, the Shift A, which will add an armature, which adds your mm -hmm. first bone, and then the Extrude button, and then you just drag bones to wherever your character are. You don't have to know anything about rigging beyond that, because once you draw your bones in the place, all you do is um, parent it under it, you know, which, you know, it's like grouping them together, and it automatically does the weights for you, and it's done, you know. Mm -hmm. If your characters are getting a little co complex, you can kind of get some pretty simple YouTube tutorials on how to... Um, it uses what's called vertex groups, which is basically just what parts of the geo is linked to what bone. And, you know, that's kind of what you do with skinning for a full 3D character. And you'd have to go in there and paint your weights and smooth it all out for when their shoulders move up and their arms bending. But with this, you can literally just go in and select, you know, a couple, a couple faces on your geo and say, delete it from that bone. And that way it won't influence anymore. So if they're moving their hand and it's moving their foot along with it, you can just pick that foot and say, delete it from that bone. And then their hand moves free. So mm -hmm. another thing that I see that you've done that, like, I think for those that may want to try this, that is really good. Is even though you're just working with straight up 2d images, you've 
rotated some of your characters in in you know and they're not all facing forward they're all facing one direction you've you've kept it you've given the illusion of a 3d space with them because some of them are at a, a three quarters angle some are straight on some have got the backs to the camera yeah um, you know it's a little for um yeah it's to fill in the crowd it's for different shots yep. for different angles too and then stuff for like if you know when we're out here walking in the club yeah because you know who sits you know everybody's standing in different directions at a concert you yep. know standing around talking and stuff even when the music's playing a lot of the time you know or they're just in a, a group together talking like this so yeah it adds a little just mm -hmm. better randomness to it you know, so and it when you're like creating stuff. like these 2d images these 2d assets these characters um are you kind of just making them on the fly or do you go in and just make a big batch to start with drawing people at different angles not yet knowing where you're going to use them or how do you approach that um for these i was kind of just making a big batch because i was doing a um let's see if i can open it up here i think i have the uh characters here to show you yeah so i would just draw a big batch like this actually they're all technical um, just, you know, with the idea that I wanted to be kind of weird clothing, future crowd people, you know, so mm -hmm. that's kind of what I try to keep in mind, but they're background people too. So I'm not really doing like thumbnails and 50 designs to nail down one or anything. These are just a bunch right. of fun ideas. It's like good practice for character design and, you know, get a bunch of ideas out. And if there's one I don't like too, you know, even though it's on the page, I can just cut it out when I bring it into Blender. Um, the only, you know, I'll spend more time if it's more of a main character, but for these, I'm just, mm -hmm. you know, it's just kind of fun experimentation playing with styles. Totally. Things, you know? so, totally. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of what I'll do. I'll take an evening where I just, I feel like just doodling and stuff. So I'll just try mm -hmm. to get like, all right, I'm going to take a couple hours and try to draw these out, you know, or at least get the line art out. And then maybe the next night I'll put the colors in and save it out. So you have all the alphas. So, but that's even cool. this, I try to keep pretty simple. I mean, it's literally just flats with, mm -hmm. um, you know, these I did paint on a little bit of a rim light because they're actually in inside the club, most of them. So there's like, I have, I'm going to have a lot of like high um, spotlights shining down on them. But mm -hmm. otherwise, I probably wouldn't have even put in this rim light on them. It would just be the shadow like under her hair here. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. As a related question that came in, um, someone's wondering, you know, when you're setting up your scene and popping all these cards in for these characters, are you just manually facing them towards the camera for the scene that they're going to be in, or is there a procedural way to get them to automatically face the camera? Um, there, I'm just bringing them in manually because it's um, mm -hmm. it's kind of per shot too. Um, okay. So you, I'm pretty sure there. I mean, there's a lot of constraint systems that you can use in Blender, and I don't know how to do it in Blender yet, but I know you could do it in Maya really easy, where you could just take a piece of geo or a card, like you're using like an explosion effect or something and have it match the rotation to the camera. So mm -hmm. wherever the camera moves, it's rotating with it. So you could do that too. But, you know, it's, I have so many of them and I'm gonna have so many shots in the end. I mean, it's probably gonna be like a couple hundred shots by the time the short's done. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that with everyone because if they're actually all rotating through a scene, it's not gonna look real, it's gonna look a little obvious for some of the way my shots are. So sure. I'd rather just kind of pre-position them in a place that doesn't look too awkward, and you know, maybe with some slight perspective and just move the camera that way, unless mm -hmm. it's for something real specific. So, But I tend, like I was saying, I, I tend to do that more for effects so that it'll stay open to screen and you won't have some weird perspective if you're circling around an explosion right, or right, smoke yeah. or something. So, cool. um, But, you know, it's stuff I'm experimenting with as I go along, too. I might change my mind down the road, too. Because, so, I mean, what this... This whole thing, I've basically learned Blender for every step of this as I put it together. And now I've got, you know, everything I kind of need and I'm actually starting to put together final shots and it's going to be a finished thing. But, you know, most of last year and a lot of lockdown was just learning all the elements. Every time I'd get to a different spot in my shot, I would have to learn how to do something new. And I'd, you know, mm -hmm. take a weekend and learn how to do that. I'd like, okay, well, now I can do that. Now I can do my crowd or I can do my grease pencil stuff so it's and, a great um, way to learn like when you when you're driven to create something and that creates a necessity to have to go figure out how to do that thing yeah um, it's nice to have yeah. a focus and that mm -hmm. kind of helps you make good progress and like know exactly what to study instead of just like kind of whatever that's blender stuff you know so um yeah and to show you so there's pluses and minuses to both ways too so you know you have your 
card there, but then you're stuck with just that card, which has a couple bones, and they can kind of sway and stuff like that. Or you know, like I, I have some in a ramen cafe, which I might have them, you know, moving their arms or kind of just moving, talking to each other. You know, real minimal stuff. Mm -hmm. If you want to get a little deeper, you can do grease pencil with like with these. And um, grease pencil has some cool stuff in it, like uh, you know, like I was saying, they don't have cast shadows but you can do like it has some effects you can add to it here like it has a rim light effect which I have on it right now which you mm -hmm. can turn off so this is how the character looked solo just isolate him for now this is how I drew him I kind of drew in my own shadows here and um, if you want to do some things like give him a rim light you can turn it on he has this and you can kind of adjust it to where your light is there I don't know if you guys can see that on the screen or not but, uh, Oops, where'd it go? There we go. So oh, yeah. You can kind yeah, of move it up and down. Yeah, so it's real light um, on it. So, mm -hmm. But you can change if it's like a multiply or an overlay for how much it affects it and stuff, like regular. Yeah, <laughs> that's really blown out, but at least you can kind of see what it's doing to it. So you can give it <laughs> Ultra really color light. dodge, yeah. Yeah, but hey, if they're like under ninth, underneath a really bright spotlight or something, you know, mm -hmm. then you're good. So... Um, so you can do that, and it, I'll show you, like, it has a shadow effect, too. You can do it, but I'll, you'll see kind of why it doesn't really work here. You know, it'll drop it. So, like, if they're standing against a wall, it could work because you can mm -hmm. kind of offset it against the wall like that, you know, and you can kind of scale oops, scale it down, you know, if they're standing away from the wall. But if there's going to be half something on the ground, if you're working in the straight-up 2D animation mode of Blender, it you know it it will work fine because it'll mm -hmm. drop it down behind them as you can see here. Um, you, know, you can scale it down and it looks like it's just flat on the ground by him. And as he moves around, it'll kind of stay looking like it's on a plane. But the problem is if you start moving around in 3D, right, it has a weird thing like that going on. So it doesn't really work, and you end up having to tweak it a lot. So you're a little limited there. So what I've actually been doing is I have some soft shadow cards that I'll lay underneath them if I need the ground to be darker in the area. So it's not their exact body shape, but it'll sort of darken the ground to sort of plant them on the ground. Sure, yeah. I, I keep going back and forth between the cards and Grease Pencil because, you know, Grease Pencil takes lights now too, but they still do kind of glow a little bit, you know? So there's mm -hmm. things I keep finding that I like better about the cards, and but I do like things about Grease Pencil, such as... Another thing you could do for just simple animation for background characters is like, you know, say I'll take this girl, for example. If she's just talking to her friends in the background, if you're walking by, like she's in the background and my guy's walking by, but in the final shot, I don't want her just standing there frozen, but it'd be really easy to just add some animation with the way Grease Pencil works. So right. if you can go in here, the way it works is Grease Pencil is cool. You can, It works just like Photoshop, the way it's laid out. So... If you go in here, bring this down so you can kind of see what's going on. Okay. So we have, like the way I drew here, I have, it works like Photoshop layers, which is another mm -hmm. reason I like it. So if you're already familiar with Photoshop, it's not a huge stretch to get used to using Grease Pencil. So, um, you and it works, whichever row is on top is what's going to pop in front of it, even though it's on a flat space like this. But, you know, if I move the line art down, you know, I could, oops, don't move it down. If I just move it down like that, now the lines are behind the color under mm -hmm. my fills here. So I just move them back up. And so same things, I want my shadows to be on top of everything. So that's kind of how you can layer your stuff, kind of like Photoshop layers. And you can see here I have it just drawn on. I have my color layer, and then I have, you know, my line art, which is just this. And then I delete it in here. But, you know, what I'll usually do is I'll just go do a rough sketch and it's its own layer, and then you draw the final art on top of it, mm -hmm. and then you can delete the sketch, and you have this ready to go. And yeah, once you don't have to leave Grease Pencil to to start the process. You just do all yeah. your sketching and final right in there. Yeah. And what's cool is you can go in here and pick it, and you see down here, when you pick your Grease Pencil object here, you can either pick it in the outliner here, which is Grease Pencil Character 16, or just select her in here in object mode. And down here, where your timeline would be, you pick the um, what's called the dope sheet, and it has a grease pencil option here. Oops. Or yeah, grease pencil option there, and you see these little dots. Those are your keyframes. So mm -hmm. 
once you go in here, so that's one keyframe. And say you just want her, you know, say her ears to be blowing in the wind. So one thing that's cool about Blender that I love is you could go to the next frame and uh, just draw the next frame like traditional animation if you wanted. But you can also, like, say I'll just go through like three frames. If you go up here to sculpt mode, which when you're working with 3D geometry, sculpt mode work is sort of like ZBrush. It's like clay sculpting. It'll open up a certain set of tools, and the geo will look a certain way, and you can start carving and flattening and inflating and stuff just like ZBrush. But when you do it with a Z, with the grease pencil object picked, it opens up a whole different set of tools here in, um, in your sculpt mode. And what it does, it almost works like an edit mode here. You can sort of see my strokes if you really zoom in. Mm -hmm. um, that I drew, which is kind of how Grease Pencil sort of works like vector graphics almost. It's actual strokes. And what you want, what you can do is you can go and use these tools on the side. So it has things like smooth and thickness. If you want to, you know, if you're drawing and you want to thicken up the line, you can make it a little fatter on the other underside, you know, like mm -hmm. where the light's hitting it. And um, if it's a little rough, you can kind of smooth it out. So it works like geometry in that way where you can tweak it. But um, you can also use the, the grab tool, which, so say the uh, wind is blowing, you know, to the right, and you want her, her ears just be doing, you can kind of just, oops, make a little bit bigger radius here. You can just start grabbing it and nudge it over. Do it in small increments so it doesn't... Uh, Kind of like using the liquify tool in Photoshop. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. exactly like that. So and it's great. So and you have that. And as you do it, you can see down here it's setting a keyframe as you go. So now that you've done that, you have your two keys. Mm -hmm. So if I go here, I'm just gonna go real quick, nudge it just a little bit more. Oops. And um here we go. And then say it now, leaves are starting to flop over. <laughs> this is going to be a little rough just because <laughs> I don't want to sure. waste too much time on it, but uh, just to kind of get the gist of it here. So, so you got that. But the thing that's cool, also cool, which makes it like traditional animation, is while you're doing this, if it's hard for you to see just frame by frame where things are going to get some smooth animation, you can go down here and they have this little dot here, which is called, uh, wait, hang on, I got to turn on onion skins. Oh yeah, there we go, it's on. Well, of course, and now it's not going to show. Come on. Where is the onion skin? Hang on. Fix it out here. Okay, of course, now that I'm showing you live, it's not going to show the onion skins. <laughs> But um, let's see, do I need to enable it here? Make sure it's going on. It should show it there. It's not. Okay, apologies. Just did this last time. Oh, night. no problem. It was working. But um, let's see if I can get it here. What's going on there? Let me go to the. Uh, Layout. So show it. Okay. Go on dope sheet. Okay. Hmm. While you're while you're setting that up, um, yeah. But one of our audience members is just curious to know if you've ever worked on an animated show similar to your art style they're they're giving it giving some love to your art style saying that if, if there were shows out there like that they'd watch it have you worked on anything similar to, to what you're doing here not really that's partly why i'm doing it because i want to see it sure. <laughs> i haven't seen anything absolutely you know? yeah um yeah I, i'm really i'm really a big fan of stuff like love death and robots it's been coming out where they're really pushing the boundaries of you know just real trippy looking animation you know real totally strange and original stuff instead of just kind of the standard kit or everything looks like simpsons or family guy or disney you know it's like there's not a lot of adult animation until recently mm -hmm. and uh 
you know, I, I want, and it's, it tends to be a lot more experimental in style. So I want more totally. of that. So I'm glad there's kind of a renaissance going right now, though. It seems like with Netflix and Hulu and, you know, all this anime they're getting in and all these animated projects they're funding. So. Uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot more, like, they can develop a lot more niches, I think, with the drastic increase in streaming content. Yeah. Um, now they can they can make something that, you know, may not cater to, you know, literally every person that would be watching at a specific, specific like, primetime time slot. Mm -hmm. But now you just go and watch it asynchronously, and, and we're getting some amazing stuff. And yeah. I loved the second season of Love, Death, and Robots, by the way, too. That was Yeah, really that's cool. some great stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I apologize. I'm not sure what's going on here. It should show animation, but I might have to abandon that for now and mm -hmm. show it some other time separately. But uh, well, we go, can see what you were doing there. Yeah. So, but basically, what it'll do is it'll turn. It'll usually turn on an onion skin. There, I'm probably forgetting something obvious. But now that I'm on the spot, <laughs> sure. But it's um, yeah. it'll basically show your onion skins before and after in a green and red thing so you can oh, okay, cool. do like traditional animation while you're drawing yeah um and uh the thing that's cool too is just one more grease pencil thing here is if you go into this character there so if you want to just draw in scene too you can go into So we got all these characters here showing. If you wanted to just draw another character to go along with these, you can take this little 3D cursor here. And the 3D cursor here is basically where things will pop up in mm -hmm. Blender when you create new stuff. So, um, so yeah, you can just kind of pop it here. Yes. Yeah, so I'm just going to do it. Uh, let's do it over here out of the way. Now what you can do is you can set that 3D cursor there. And then same way as you added the... Geo, you can go into Shift A to show a new uh, grease pencil blank, which will make this grease pencil object over here. And when you do that, it enables this little object over here, which you can do a new layer. And with that, so when you have a grease pencil layer, you can just start drawing. If you, you can either have it snap to geometry, or you can just draw in the axis here. So we have it here is if you go into draw mode here you have this up here which shows the front X and Z or the side YZ that's the axis you can draw in so when based on where your cursor is so you can either draw to view if you're just drawing like on top of like a 3d environment to do traditional that way or if you want to do draw, draw in scene you have this and then once you have it you go into your tool here. Oh yeah, you gotta go pick here. So the way it works though is it doesn't use this, it uses like shaders basically. So once you have your material here, I already created some, so like if you have the uh, like a shadow thing here, you can do actually let me create a new one just for line art. So you can create a new one, it's a stroke, it's black, line solid and when you do that it's just going to basically draw from wherever your cursor is in that axis no matter what your angle is it's oh, okay. always going to draw so if you start going like this and you start dolling around it's still going to stick to that axis yeah whereas oops, if you turn off this front z and you just do it to view it'll just basically draw where we are so if i'm drawing an x here and then i go over here and i draw another x you know, you can kind of see now they're going all these different angles and different spots, mm -hmm. which can be a little problematic. <laughs> um, yeah, it just gives you a good way of being able to control those planes so yeah. you don't wind up with wonky wonky lines. Yeah. So, But what's cool is you can do that, and you, know, you can sit up here and maybe just sit here and draw like you're, you, know, you got your, you got here. We'll do stand in there, you know, just real quick. Yeah, I'll make it vaults. You know, I'll give black hair just so I don't have to draw. <laughs> draw black. What's cool is, so say you have this, you know, it's a real simple guy and he's in that geometry there. So you go in your grease pencil object, and so that could be like your lines, you could call it. 
and then create a new grease pencil layer and call this your colors. And you can move that down behind it. Mm -hmm. And you go back to your shaders here and pick another one. So you have pick some of the ones I've made. So let's give him uh, let's give him a green outfit here. Oops, sorry. Create a new one here. I forgot that's his. Uh, so give him blue jeans here. So you pick blue. You've got that picked. And the thing is, is the blue here is set as a fill instead of a stroke. So if you're drawing on a stroke here, it does lines like this. Mm -hmm. But if you set it to fill instead, it works almost like a stroke or like the pen tool or something like an illustrator. Sure. And you can go here and just draw your shapes. So it's a really quick way to fill in your cells like traditional animation. So yeah. as you're going through frame by frame, you have this. And the thing is, as you color it too, you can either recolor it on every frame or you can just nudge it around to match it, whichever is easier. So you That's have great. that, you know, give them like a, oops, like a white shirt or something, you know, since these are all rockabilly, we'll stick with the theme. You know? <laughs> so, um, but once you have all that, you know, he's done. And then you can add your, you know, one more layer here, move it down, which is like your, or move it up, which is like your shadow layer. Same thing, you go back to your shadow, and it's the fill, and then, you know, say there's a up light, you just got that there. And then you have your dark shadows underneath, you know, so. Mm -hmm. And then you have it, and then once you have that, it, you can see down here, it's made your grease pencil object that's keyframed. So if you want to go a couple frames later, draw it, if you go back to your lines here, shader there we go um, then you can start drawing his next position on it you know and this is mm -hmm. the thing where this is the thing that's killing me where it won't show me the uh, <laughs> um, onion skinning but that's where you'd normally turn on the onion skin ah there it goes it's working yay okay cool. <laughs> I don't know why I wasn't working on the other character this is literally the same scene in the same setting but uh, yeah there you go so now as you go along, so let me turn off the colors and everything just to kind of make it a little easier to see too. So the green is the preset shot, so now you can draw, you know, say he's going to be leaning to the side, you know. Yeah. He's like falling over, but he's still got his legs here, you know. Um, so then, and it just creates it for you as you go, and then go a couple frames later, and same thing, you draw the next one, you know. Like, uh, and there's grease pens. You know, there's onion skin settings you can go to here. You can show how many frames before and after you want to see, so you can see more. So, as you go back now, you can see the after frames which are in purple. So you can really just do straight ahead traditional animation, and it's all mm -hmm. on this axis in scene. So if you want to just draw some background characters like that, you can just sit there drawing these characters, and um, you know animating them straight ahead in scene. You know, so if he's leaning against a wall, you can have your 3D wall and have him leaning against it. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, just animate straight to that instead of just imagining yeah. how it looks in your separate software, Photoshop or animation software, hoping it looks good when you bring it in, So, which is great. And you're coloring it and sort of putting a rim light on it if you want. And they have some other crazy effects, too, you can do in the scene if you want that's um, put them back on. Yep. Oops. That'll, if you really want to play with it, they have a lot of other effects you can do to like, you know, you can kind of do like a pixelate thing if you really want to get stylized, which can get kind of crazy. Oops. Now, when you're doing your cell shading on these, uh, does uh, Grease Pencil also have kind of some of those traditional blend modes? Like you can just set up a multiply layer and. It, um, no, it's pretty much just flats on top of it. Gotcha. Um, so you just make yeah. it translucent then. Yeah. You can okay. just change the translucency and then, yeah. So, because here you can see, like, I have all my layers for this character here. Um, and you have, each one has, like, an opacity in there. Oops. Yeah, there's something messed up with this scene. Why I won't, uh, all these characters are grayed out for some reason. So I'm not sure what's going on there. But, um, but yeah, you can play with the opacity to... Yes. Yeah, oops, that's the onions getting. I'm sorry, wrong one. There you go. 
but yeah, so you can kind of play with the opacity and like the shadow here. You can make it dark, you know, solid black or just lighter mm -hmm. based on how you want your scene to look. So yeah, yeah. So same as Photoshop layers with just the opacity like that. And then I haven't even gotten into this, but you can use like masks for it. And there's tint colors and you know wow. stroke thickness. But you know, I mostly just stick to the basic stuff. And then if you want to go tweak it too, like I was saying, even if you have, um, you know, even if you draw here, like I was saying and you don't like quite how it looked, like the lines are too thin, you don't have to even redraw it. You can just kind of go into the sculpt mode, like I was saying, and just go into the thickness and like maybe thicken the lines on her chin and stuff. Mm -hmm. just a little line art. Oh, yeah, one of our viewers on Twitch is, is curious to know if you ever use Blender for storyboarding, uh, given what you're showing us here. I've been thinking about it. I've been trying to figure out a fast way to do that because it would mm -hmm. be cool to kind of do it in grease pencil. And I've been thinking about doing it for some shots coming up, if anything, to just have like a grease pencil character that I'm kind of drawing a few poses and then you can, and because the, the grease pencil object is still a 3D object in your scene and you can still keyframe it for rotation and scale and everything if you want to mm -hmm. move it around aside from, you know, hand animating it. So, you know, you could have him here and say, you know, you can set a key here and go a few frames ahead. Um, go to the timeline here. Yeah, and bring him over here. Hit a keyframe there. And then, you know, now he's animating across your scene. So, you right. know, you can say he's going to drag him here, and then you could change, then you could draw a new grease pencil pose on that frame. And so then when it gets to this frame, it pops to the new pose. And that would work kind of like it's kind of like in between animatics and storyboards, which would actually be really cool. And it's yeah something I definitely want to experiment with. So um, because I've already kind of done that on projects in the past too. Like I'll draw. I mean, it's it's sort of how I discovered doing the card people in here and doing grease pencil too. Is I used to draw storyboards in Photoshop, and I'd export out the cards on alphas and bring them into Maya. <laughs> And I would just mm -hmm. have one pose on one card and I'd have them like jumping off a roof. And when they land, you hide that card and bring in another image. <laughs> that's the pose where they land. So you have to hide that image and make the next image of him landing visible. So it's kind of like doing that, but without, you know, the grease pencil features where you can just have it on a keyframe. You actually have to bring mm -hmm. in two different objects. So, so yeah, you can definitely do that. I just haven't practiced with it enough because I'm mm -hmm. you know, doing eight million <laughs> things, you know. Sure. But, um, I, <laughs> I your battles. Yeah. And, but, you know, now that I sort of have like a bit of an animatic put together and I'm doing some of the boards, I actually probably will go and start doing that with blocking out some of the shots. Um, so, all right. So that's said, and I will show you one more character thing I do here too. Um, just to show you the three ways I make characters. Because the thing I want, too, is I want them to all match my style, too. So mm -hmm. this is kind of the approach you could do for your art style, too, and I want them to work for all of them. So there's the cards, which are just your own drawings in Photoshop. There's Grease Pencil, which works like Photoshop in here, and you can still draw on your style. And then the other thing you can do is if you go into this, this character, um, you can basically just hand draw your line are on here the way you want and it works just like grease pencil just like photoshop where you have um pressure sensitivity and opacity for your drawing and everything and it works you you'd have to get a little bit into how to do nodes to make it work um in uh grease pencil for like drawing it so you have to learn how to mm -hmm. kind of put a couple basic nodes together but it's not really that hard and it's pretty much just putting on you know, just connecting a couple nodes and making a blank image so that you can draw straight on it. And um, like I can show you real quick. Well, we had a question coming a while back relative to this because they were yeah. been saving it from when we jumped into the 3D characters. Um, is everything on these 3D characters hand drawn, or use, or is there some of the cross hatching like procedural as well? Or um, everything I've shown so far is hand drawn. So okay. this is all hand drawn on there, but I'll show you as well, um, which I was going to bring up. Let me uh, minimize this guy. Oh, yeah, this was another one I did, just kind of doing the same thing. I kind of hand drew everything on there. This was actually for a client based on his design, but I used some grease pencil for just the beard lines here, mm -hmm. and then I hand drew a lot of the 
head and face details and stuff too. Um, Look so at you, that. That's you great. can get pretty close and it's pretty decent resolution. And it's all, mm -hmm. the thing that's great is you're just drawing on the 3D model. You're not drawing it flat on a UV space and importing it and hoping it looks good and back and forth. It kind of knocks out that middle step, which used to drive yeah. me crazy, <laughs> you know? So, um, let's see here. But yeah, I'll show you, um, this is the character that you saw probably on the flyer for the project or for the stream tonight. This is based on a Mark Millar character, um, the guy who created Kick-Ass and uh, mm -hmm. all that. This is his uh, graphic novel called Starlight, which is like my favorite graphic novel. And I did this project a while back because he has his whole division at Netflix now where he's making all his projects. And I was praying I could just show him this on Twitter and he'd think it's really cool and he'd maybe let me do an animated version of this show. But alas, this one project he sold to Disney, so they have uh, the rights. Which it's not all bad because the guy they're doing a live action version of it, and the guy oh, who cool. wrote and directed Attack the Block is the one doing it, which is pretty cool. Nice. So, but actually, just a couple of days ago, I tweeted some of this stuff, and um, Mark Miller himself replied and said it looks really cool. And then that's when he mentioned who was directing it and stuff too. So gotcha. Um, but I'll show you this too, to kind of show you some of the procedural stuff you can do in it too. I, I'm still learning this stuff a little bit, so I don't have, I can't like build a shader for you. I've sort of been using a hodgepodge of pre-made shaders and shaders I've made myself in the past for uh, making procedural line work. But the thing I've been finding, I, I, Part of the reason I'm not super advanced on it is I've sort of abandoned it a little bit for my project because what I keep running into is it looks really good like this. So if you can, if you zoom in here, this isn't drawn. Like I have these little lines here, like tattering on the material is drawn, but all these lines for the shadowing, that's all procedural. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is like it looks really good for 2D images. So if I was going to be rendering out stills or like a comic book or something, it would actually look really cool. But um, um, but for some reason, well, not for some reason, but in a scene moving around, I'm not. I start to get moray patterns, which are like when you get far away, it starts making these weird patterns. It's probably can't see it over the stream, but when you dolly around, it starts making it look like these. these I can see a little bit of that patterns in it. Yeah. yeah. So if I make them a little bit higher scale space them out it'll get rid of it but then it doesn't look as good for me mm -hmm. and to get fine enough detail i also run into the problem that i was mentioning earlier which i think is a problem with a lot of 3d objects for 2d animation is it starts making it look like a 3d object like 3d shading yeah. and i don't like that so after experimenting with it a bunch i've sort of abandoned it and going back to just the straight up um cell shading with the shadow and just my hand drawn art on it seems to look the best and it looks closest to like my comic art style too okay so, but there is, I mean, there is some really cool stuff and I do enjoy playing with it. And I'd like to do maybe something really specific for it, especially up close. It can look really cool because you can really get in there. Like, um, this was actually one, you can actually buy this on the blender market. This is combined with another shader of mine, but just do these lines. You can actually play with, um, oops, oops sorry, I the wrong object here for his head. I'll show you. You can kind of play with, um, the procedural part of it. There we go. So you can kind of take it out. You can play with the opacity and the darkness. You can have your line size for scale, you know, and how much it takes up, you know. Mm -hmm. So you can have it go across there, the whole thing, or just a little bit on the edges, which is kind of cool because it's almost like traditional comic book inking, like these real. Yeah. Get that half tone going box. on. Yeah, which I like that. I mean, I, I spent a few years in my 20s as an assistant inker for a guy at Image Comics and stuff. So. I kind of have some traditional inking training, so I, I, I dig this stuff. But at the same time, I think it works for stills, but not full animation. You know, like same with this one here. Like, and it depends on your UV space too. Like this gets a little clumpy in certain areas, but if you lay out the, U you can either have it project by camera or world space or mm -hmm. by your UVs, and it has different results for both. Like this is based on an object; it makes it very even. It's based on the camera, but you can see as it moves around it's sort of getting this rotating effect. So it wouldn't do that if I did it by UVs, but then all your UVs are going different directions, so then the lines will be going different directions when you apply it. So um, if I go in here, like I can show you. Yeah, like this is based on UV, but if I do it by normal, 
see how it changes it. It doesn't die on me. Eh, not hugely different. Sometimes it's not way different until you start moving around either, too. Like sure. Like my camera. Yeah, that's not a good example there. Let's see. Put it on my shoulder pad here. Um, but I, the UVs on a shoulder pad are very simple, so they have a real nice even layout here, which is great. Um, but then, let's see if I do it like generated, what it'll do to it. It's all wacky. Yeah, of course, it's going to look the same no matter what. <laughs> For that, um, but there's a yeah, there's one called a, if you search shader first on the verse on the Blender Market, it has a few kind of cool, non photo real procedural renderers. Mm -hmm. that you can download and apply to your characters that look pretty cool, and this is one of them. It's called Shader Verse, which sort of mocks the into the Spider Verse thing, obviously. So mm -hmm. yeah, you can just kind of play with your lines there. You can play with the angle, you know, for like if they're going up or down, you know. It's kind of hard. To, you can kind of see, even as I'm messing with it, it's hard to see because it gets those weird patterns and stuff. And yeah. You know, that's not just a problem with the live stream. That's a problem with doing your shots, too. So you end up doing so gotcha. much work with every shot to try to avoid that. You know, like you see this kind of rolling effect as I go across, you know, and that just kind of kills it for me. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, it has potential for stills because it'd be cool to just kind of render out these as stills for a comic book and then just kind of do some touch up on top would be cool too so um, uh, someone on twitch is uh wanting to know if you can show us an example of just like quick demo of drawing lines directly onto the 3d model yeah yeah i was gonna show you that here um let's see i'll open up the next thing for you i'm gonna close this heavy scene free up some memory okay oh i'll show you one other quick thing before i do that sure this was one i was gonna show um, I won't get too sidetracked because I do want to show that. But another thing, if you don't want to like rig and model and stuff like that, you could have a real simple model like this. I'll show you just, it's real simple geometry. This is all it is. And you can draw with grease pencil and have it snap to the geometry when you draw. And you can do the same thing. So I just painted on this, like I'm going to show you, where you're just actually drawing on the 3D object like textures. Mm -hmm. And then you can take a grease pencil and when you draw, it'll snap to your geometry like this. Same with the mouth. And then you can just keep drawing with keyframes the same way so that when you go through, I'll show you down here, my dope sheets, there's pencil. So as you go through, now you can kind of just traditionally animate all his expressions. You know, he's got some of his blinks, you know, he's looking around and everything. And so, you know, you could kind of draw your lip sync to a character. And the thing that's cool is when it's on there, it's all snapped to his face. So you could still take this character. Oh, I don't have a constraint on this one. But um, you could actually go here. I'm pretty sure you can just uh, grant it to object. There you go. Yeah, there you go. I didn't do his eyebrows, but I did his mouth mm -hmm. and his eyes, and they just stick with it. So now you can just rotate it and move it through your scene. So mm -hmm. yeah, you can almost do still traditional animation with real simple geometry. So I just thought that was a cool way to do it and real fast way to get your drawings done. So I will open up a guy here to show you. Now, I had a question uh, earlier on in the stream about um, kind of combining 2D and 3D in a scene, and if there are any difficulties kind of tracking the 2D in a, in a 3D scene. Is that sort of a moot point because the 2D animation technically is being treated like a 3D plane, or? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing. Like, it would depend on the shot, um, mm -hmm. you know, based on how dynamic the move is, but generally, like if it's just something, you know, because it's going out of frame or something like I was showing you, if you have a grease pencil object, then you can just, you know, animate the grease pencil object to stay in the world space that you want in the shot. Sure. So, um, so yeah, like if you have, if you have a guy running and you have a camera going along tracking and I'm, hopefully this is kind of along the lines of what they were thinking. Um, you can uh, do the camera, you know, going along one axis and then you can just take your grease pencil object, maybe draw one pose of the guy running, and it's it works like a card. It's just the grease pencil object. Then you can keyframe it to slide along with your camera, 
Mm -hmm. So that way you can start scrubbing back and forth with your camera and the guy's dragging with it, but then you can go through and each, every two or three frames, you can just draw a new pose and you've already mm -hmm. got him moving along in space with them. So all you do is the pose in the same space and then, you know, it'll keep up with the camera or you could just draw your run cycle in space and then keyframe it with your camera. Sure. Okay. And, um, you know, and there's nothing special you need to set up for that. You just create your grease pencil object and it's ready to go like that. There's no special setup. So, um, okay. So this guy here, I will show you. Hopefully, this is the uh, non textured one. Okay. All right, well, I'll just start over. So this is a character, actually, hang on, let me open an earlier one. This is a character that came in straight from, um, straight from Character Creator. This is how they look when they come into Blender. I sculpted it and brought him in. And, oops, of course, that one's messed up, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Bring in this one. All right. So this is a textured one, but I'll just all break the textures and kind of show you how they work. Um, I'm just loading them right now. Well, this is loading in. Uh, we had a viewer who was wondering if you were utilizing Character Creator at all for your animations, or if you were doing all of that in Blender. I'm doing all of it in Blender because I'm using the uh, mocap on my rig, so I have to use okay. my rig. I can't use that. I mean, I could just put it on those skeletons and bring it in, but then it's harder to manipulate. So, ooh, we're getting short on time already too. So let me get going quick here. Sure. Um, so yeah, this guy I kind of drew it on, but let me uh, blow out these nodes here and I'll show you. Turn off screencast keys again too. So, that stuff, bones get out of the way. All right, so if I go over here, There it is. Okay. So let me just wipe all this stuff out. Start fresh. So I have a two-step thing I do too. So when you create a basic shader, when when you create a new one, actually I'm just gonna create a brand new one. Let's just delete this, create a new one personally. It just gives you this principle BDSF which just makes this, it's sort of like, if you know Maya, it's like a Lamper, a real basic mm -hmm. plain shader that has a bunch of plugins that you can start doing more advanced stuff with, but you don't need to. So, but the, the advantage is you can kind of see some shadows under here for where mm -hmm. you're drawing is kind of like a guide. So what I'll do to start is you go in here and create a texture and just image texture. And it gives you this node here and you just plug the color into the base color. It's going to be black now, but it won't be for long. Um, so one specific thing about character creator that people might want to know is if you, let me go into the texture paint mode here. Um, character creator uses a thing called UDIM uh, textures, which is like if you know UV space like this, there's the U space, which is the left to right, and the V, which is you know the vertical up mm -hmm. and down. And what the, they have a way of using multiple UV spaces for one surface and um and it's called udim textures so when you do it you have to have multiple you have to have what they call a tiled texture to do it and that so you can see how the uvs are laid out here you have like the head it's mainly so you can have um things like the head take up more uv space instead of being crowded in a corner mm -hmm. with the arms and legs so you can get better resolution on each texture for it without gotcha. having to have some sort of weird thing where you have to pick each face and apply shaders to it separately. Uh, the coordinates are basically set up with your UVs. So, um, so yeah, you can see how that's laid out here. There's the face, the body, the arms. So if we go back to my layout here. So what you want to do when you create it is you say new image. And I tend to work either 4K or 8K, depending on what your computer can handle, just because I want it to be nice, clean lines. So if your computer's slower, you can still draw like this on a lower resolution, and you can just go in on Photoshop and use it as a guide and draw and clean up your lines. Um, but I'll do like 4K now just to kind of show um, clicks and uh, hopefully 
you have resolution. So I'll set the resolution there. I'll call it you know, body line art. And the color I the color here is basically what your background of your texture images is going to be to start. And since you're going to be drawing lines on the character, I'm going to go with white, obviously. I don't really need an alpha because I'm not going to be using alphas for anything. I just layer it kind of like Photoshop files because Blender mm -hmm. has nodes that work like multiply and overlay and screen and stuff like that. So you can just layer them like that. Um, but the one specific thing you want to do for Character Creator to use UDIMS is this box called Tiled at the bottom, and that sets up those tiled textures. So you just say OK, it'll create it. And so, yeah, you can see here it's created the first shader, which is just the head there. So if you go into Texture Paint here, I know, sorry if this is boring technical stuff when you just want to see drawing, but uh, I, I've seen a lot That's of good. about Character Creator too, and uh, if you're going to bring a Character Creator into Blender to, to, to texture it, this is you're going to run into this problem, and it's a real pain. It was a real pain in the butt the first time I was trying to figure out how to do it. So, and this just has to do with the way that those those models are set up. You could you could create a character or basic geo in Blender and just go in and start drawing yeah. on it, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is just specifically for this because especially if you're going to be drawing on the model here, if you mm -hmm. don't set it up this way, then when you draw like basically from the neck onto the chest, it's not going to transfer to the next UV space here. I see. I see. So. But basically, when you set up that tiled, what it does is when you go into Texture Paint here and you pick your image here, which is the body line art, which is the one we're working on, um, it has this thing here. It's called UDIM Tiles. It's already set up the source. Instead of single image, what it normally be, it's um, UDIM Tiles. And what you can do here is you can see here there's six tiles total. It's already created one. So now we're just going to add five more. So you just hit the plus button here and say how many do you want the count, just five more. And I don't even worry about the label or anything, just the color. Make sure they're white again. And you go in there. I don't worry about alpha. Keep the resolution the same and say OK. And it's going to create them. You can see it's now it's filled them in all white. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what you do now is you go under image here. Like this is all still one important thing to remember with Blender 2 is always save your images. Because when you first create a texture like this, it's not an actual file yet. It's kind of just in, in your RAM, in Blender. So if you save your mm -hmm. project like this and you haven't saved out the image, every once in a while, for some reason, it's open to back up and been fine. But if it ever disappears or it doesn't load back in, it's gone forever because it's nowhere. So you go in here and save as, and this will actually make physical files um, for your character. So let's see, the guy here, put it in there Oops. and save them in there. So. Now you have all your textures, and you can go into Texture Paint here. And you can basically just start drawing now. So you have it here, and go here. Like I just used, these are your color pickers here. And you have, it's kind of like brushes in Photoshop. You have like your spacing here, which can make it real little faster, you can add some jitter to it. Um, you can see even has stroke stabilization to kind of smooth out your lines if you're not really good with <laughs> clean lines. Um, but the main thing I do is I want a nice solid clean line. So what I'll do is I go under here, I, I turn on this button here, which is the pressure sensitivity. Or actually, no, that's for, oh yeah, sorry. This is for pressure sensitivity radius. This one you could turn on if you wanted to adjust your opacity as you draw too but I don't like that. I like it just a solid line. So I leave strength of one. I even go down to here where it has a custom, the fall off, and you can pick this one. You have different ones, which works like opacity, but I just make it all solid because I wanted a solid line. And then, yeah, then you can basically just start dolling around your character and drawing. So like if you have, you know, so you're going to draw a shirt on them, you know, you have it here you just start drawing in 3d space and the thing that's cool is as i draw this you know say well oh, actually let me undo that i'll show you the other thing too you'll want to turn this off and on so you want to stay slightly asymmetrical but if you turn on the x-axis here especially for things like now let's put some hair on his arm you know, give him like hairy arms like this to start and as you go here, you see it's applying it over here too. So oh, okay. You do double yeah. work, you know. So, and same thing here. So, if I'm going to draw like, you know, a tank top on them, you know, kind of come around and meet the line there. Going to draw it going under the 
sleeve here, draw the back. So, yeah, and then that's where you might want to turn off your symmetry after that. You know, you can draw kind of some of your muscle shapes in here too. You know, you could draw like your your neck muscles, and you have you could turn off your symmetry and draw like the jugular. And you can go in and start drawing like you got your oops, turn on X again. You can draw your lips here. Wobbly, but yeah. So I can get a little more unique, you know, kind of start getting skin textures in, turn it back on. You can get your nose lines, stuff like that. And uh, you can draw your eyebrows. And it looks a little wonky on this 3D surface here, but the thing that's cool is. I won't go too far on this. I'll just get a few more quick lines just to show you. This will also replace some of the outline too, because um, you want your characters to have an outline in animation too. So once you have this, you have your texture drawn, make sure you go into image here again and say save, or you can save all images to make sure everything's saved. But the thing that's cool is as you're drawing, you can see it laying it out on your UVs here too. And you can actually go over here and draw too if it's easier. You draw like a, you know, like chest, yeah, and you can see it <laughs> there, yeah, so. um, but yeah, so once you have this, you can go back to your layout section here, and now you can make your toon shader, which the toon shader in Blender is super easy, so what I'm going to do for now is I'm going to disconnect this texture, and you take your principles of BDSF here, and you do a shift A and make a converter to convert it to just basic RGB channels. And stick that in there. And then you want to do another converter, which is a color ramp, which is just a black and white color ramp, and turn it to uh, constant. And that is basically your shader colors, as you'll see here as I bring it down. There you go. It's like instant tune shader. That's great. Um, and it, can, it goes based off your light, too. So if you have your light here, start dragging it around and adjusting it for how you want it on your character. So I'm testing it. So, and the thing that's cool is once you have that, you, the way the nodes work in here, you can start laying up textures like this with your colors on top of your line art is you add a, under the color, you have a mix RGB, which I'll put that in there too. Let me zoom in here. Is the mix RGB is basically what makes it work like a Photoshop layer, where you have your mix, mm -hmm. you have darken, multiply. It's all the exact same settings as like a Photoshop layer. And so what I'll do is, since it's line art, I'll do it as a multiply, and put it on top, and it has two channels for inputs. So the first color is this black and white of the shadow, and now I'll bring in the textures and put it in here. Actually, I want to do it reverse. So bring it full so yeah so now there so you have your line art multiplied over the um, black and white uh, shadows and you have this FAC slider here which is basically just the amount of opacity kind of of this color too so you can make it a lighter or like a solid black if you want to go all film noir but you know you don't want to hide all your beautiful line art so and then there you have it and then you know, that's, that's cool. Kind of flat shaded kind of tune character. And then you can just keep going through and adding details. And that's how you sort of end up with, um, sorry. It's opening up here. That's kind of how you end up with this guy, which is his textures load. You'll see shirt. Yeah. So that's basically the exact thing I did. And actually the only other thing you have to do is, if you want to go in and add some color to it, you could even add just another one to the top of it, and you could put your, your lines into it and then just pick a color here, like a skin color. This wouldn't work with the, sh with the shirt, of course, but if you just had like a skin texture or something, you could just make it like kind of this pinkish skin color and then plug that into your colors here. And you're still doing a multiply, so yeah, there you go. So, you know, you have your 
colors on that and then you can kind of just adjust your skin shader underneath to be how you want it to look you know <laughs> so oops sorry got to bring that to full so you can get your full color but yeah then you can really adjust your skin color which will save you some time or if you have like an alien creature you know you can just make him a blue sure. dry your textures <laughs> on top of it and, you know you're done so you don't have to sit there and like go into photoshop and fill the texture with that color or draw it in yourself right but then you could always just add another texture note on top of it and then draw your white shirt on top of that you just add another texture here put another like screen layer on it and then just draw on top of it so and that's pretty yeah good. built up this guy and like you know a lot of the time i'll get really out of control with it and i'll just have like a layer for the shirt i'll have a layer for the pants i'll have a layer for the skin everything and um you know, it can get pretty complicated, which wouldn't be great for like a final project. But once you're done with that, it's still all uh, PNG files or TIFF files that you can save out in Photoshop. And then you can just kind of layer them all together to save as one single texture when you're done. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, very um, cool. Yeah. So I guess, man, it's going quick. Um, I always wonder, I always worry that I'm not going to have enough to fill up the time and then you have barely enough time to show anything. That's usually <laughs> how it goes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'll show you uh, just a um, couple of it, like how I build my scenes real quick here. And if, if there's some questions coming up you want to ask, too, I can do it while I'm doing this. Um, um, near the end. Yeah, I want to catch up on some of the earlier questions. Um, yeah. There was there was an interesting question that came in um, asking about, uh, you know, there the, the, here's a person who's interested in creating these kinds of scenes and, like, setting up the shots and doing some of the animation, uh, but they're not really quick at 3D modeling. Um, so they will like set up a shot using other people's assets. Um, yeah. Is there like, what would be a best practice for doing something like that? They're concerned about like, hey, is this is this frowned upon? Is this okay? Oh, no, not at all. Especially when you're doing your own projects. I mean, you know, there's stuff like Kitbash 3D and stuff, which mm -hmm. I'll use, which I've been using in parts of these scenes. Like, in, I actually have another version of this scene that um, it was kind of too heavy to demo here because they're pretty high res and the textures are high res, but I kind of drew textures are loading now, but I drew the two main buildings I have with the little strip down the middle and it has my rockabilly club. But aside from that, the rest of this, it's going to have a bit more city surrounding it. And I actually bought the um, future slums kit bash 3d thing. And I brought in a few buildings from mm -hmm. that and just filled it totally. in. So, um, yeah. and even, even the other scene, like the, um, the, uh, the original scene I showed with the guy walking, I have the whole surrounding city, which is just like all just city in the distance with all the twinkling lights and stuff in the sky. That's actually like a, a cyber C 3D city I bought and duplicated off of ArtStation. And all I did was just project a texture on it to give it the effect of the lights. So, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and, and in the question, there was a concern about, you know, some people say this makes you less of an artist or use other people's assets. But I'd argue to say that it's in part of the art is the way that you use the asset. You know. Yes, especially with 3D, like just being creative and finding a way to work it into your thing. I mean, obviously, I think the only way that it would make you not, I mean, that's the same argument as saying you shouldn't use photo ref when you're drawing, you know, people and stuff. <laughs> sure. It's like, well, you don't want to be a slave to it where you can't draw without it, but you definitely need to have reference. It'll make you a better artist and there's nothing wrong with using it. And same with this, you know, you can work in, I mean, to especially if you're doing your own anime project to think that anyone has the time to animate every object themselves. Mm -hmm. It's just insanity, you know? I mean, there's no way. I mean, even professional studios don't do that. You know, like full visual effects houses with 100 people, if they still can buy like a really cool textured building from Kitbash 3D, they're gonna do it and stick it in there because it's still gonna save a couple days of modeling and they could have that mm -hmm. work on something more important. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't feel bad about that stuff at all. Um, and yeah, just fill out your scene with it, especially if, because you could bring in like some basic assets, but then you can light it how you want, or you could change, you know, you could bring in a 3D model, but then texture it how you want, change the colors on it, or just add some things on top. Like, mm -hmm. like I can show you here one cool thing that you can do. Let me just delete this real quick. This can, if you want to make like a future city and stuff, you can. Um, another cool Blender feature is it can bring in vector graphics and make objects from you too and make geometry so if you go into you if you have illustrator or something you know adobe illustrator or something like that you can export anything in there that's vector graphics as an svg file and then when you do that you can go to your 
the thing here. I'll bring in this sign here. And you bring in when you import the SVG, it brings in these. I'll bring them over where we can see them. I'm just gonna isolate them here. So, so, so these are basically the curves brought in from Illustrator. And you can see here it's just a series of curves. And what you can do is when they when it's brought into Blender, it gives you this little kind of loop thing here which is how it affects the curves and it has this geometry thing. So if you pick it here, actually I'm gonna, these are all individuals, but I'm just gonna join them right now to make it easier. So now it's all one curve. Go down here and you can say geometry bevel and, oops, sorry, offset, there, extrude, <laughs> third time strap. There's a bunch of things you can do with it, but I pretend to just use extrude because I like just the straight kind of mm -hmm. geometric piece, but. Um, so you can do that here, and it's like instant geometry for you, and it works just like in 3D space, so you can actually add a shader to it. You can go up here and create a texture, just make a uh, emission shader, and just make it like, I don't know, it's a, make it a green neon, uh, let's make it a red neon sign. And you have your bloom effect, which you can turn on and off in Blender. And when you go to shader and bring up the strength really high, then it just starts glowing like a neon sign. You know? Nice. And yeah. so you don't even really need many 3D skills for modeling. If you know how to use, you know, like Photoshop stuff, you can actually bring in to Illustrator and you can vectorize shapes in there too, and then just export it as curves, and it's the same thing. So when well, you get that 3D effect, you could even like lower the opacity and give it like a, a hologram, like instant Blade Runner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> kind of a feel, yeah. Yeah, like you could go into, um, you'd have to probably do a, a um, thing with the shader for it. Like you'd have to use a different shader layout to give you mm -hmm. the opacity. This one is just like like a Maya surface shader. It's just a solid bright color, so there's no really mm -hmm. opacity settings. But you could totally combine it with another node and give it some transparency. <laughs> And then, yeah, you're just like Blade Runner, and you can fill up your scene with it. So, And if you exit out, um, so I can bring it back here. Come on. Sorry. Almost there. There we go. <laughs> it's a pretty heavy scene. Um, but the thing that's cool too is you don't even really have to know about lighting a lot of the time with this too. Is um, oh, come on, it's been working great until now. Close some things. It might have crashed on me. I'll just reopen it. It doesn't take too long. But yeah. Well, and I while you're setting that up, I think just also just like a callback to to using you know already like pre-made assets and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. Even before the world of 3D, I mean, this has been done in film. For eons, yeah. you know, you, if you can buy something off the shelf and modify it a little bit and save time in a production, like, yeah, that, there's an art to just doing that. Um, oh yeah, I've also. done it a ton. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I wish I brought, you know, set up a scene to show today where I do that, where I've used more of them because I have used them a lot, you know. So I think even this one, I think, well, no, not so much. Um, but yeah, I've, I've used it a lot in other scenes, so <laughs> don't feel bad about that at all. Use all you can and just mix it in with mm -hmm. the stuff because, I mean, there's no shame in that at all. It's just be, it's working smart, you know? I mean, that's being a pro, in my opinion. You know, that's it's not working smart if you think you're going to do everything by yourself because you're not going to meet your deadline or get anything done in any reasonable amount of time. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I uh, so, yeah, I brought in, you know, this one has the neon sign that has the card people and like the shot will basically be a guy in 3d walking by in the background and he sits down at the seat. So the shot will always be looking from this angle and I'll probably put some bones in these guys and have them just kind of moving around eating, you know, cause you don't really need much more than that. It's still loading the textures. I'll show you. Uh, it's really, after you've taken us through all of it, it's really cool to yeah. see all of it together. And you know, you're keeping that sort of cell shaded, comic graphic style consistent through all the elements and it all just blends together like yeah. i don't feel like i'm looking at 2d cards sitting in front of geometry 
you know, with a 3D, a 3D character walking in front of it. Yeah, because that's kind of my main um, uh, goal with it, too. Like, I'll show you this lineup, too, I meant to show you earlier. Because I put all my characters together in one scene, and I wanted to make sure they all match up. And they, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's hard to tell it apart, you know, hopefully. <laughs> um, let me still load detection. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that one will be loaded in the background. But, yeah, so I made this a long time song, and it's up there. I'll jump back and forth. I'll show you the other thing once it's loaded. But the thing that's cool, too, is you can go into, um, you can turn off all your lights here in the scene. If you don't really know how to light and things like that, if you don't have those 3D skills, you can go under, uh, turn off all the lights in the scene. Okay, so there's no lights in the scene. All this stuff is just texturing to make it glow. But what's cool is it has, So Blender has this effect called, you have these little fake light effects for the EV render, which is what I'm using. And it has an irradiance volume, which will be like a fake bounce light effect. Mm. So it'll basically make this cube and it has these little dots in there. And in this cube is where it's going to be bouncing lights around. It's not as good as if you're using cycles where, because what cycles does is it's a, like a full render and it'll take things like this sign or these glowing effects underneath here and it'll bounce lights around to make it light the scene like a real sign would, but Eevee doesn't do that. So this kind of does a version of that. So if I just kind of scale it around to generally the space that I want it to be in, scale it out, scale it to Y. Oh, I there's a, there's it also an Eevee screen space reflections plugin out there. Have you seen that one? It kind of it sort of it it essentially fakes screen space reflections. Well, um, in Eevee. this sort of has that too. Um, like okay. that's what this is right here. This is actually a reflection plane. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if I turn this off, actually, I wonder if I can just delete it. If it'll stop working, it might not work without the lights. Let me turn on lights real quick okay so you can see here i have this reflective surface in this wet street and it's only showing the reflection of my area lights up here it's not actually showing mm -hmm. the environment but if i undo here and bring that reflection you can see here i just turned it on and it's starting awesome. to reflect the environment so that's what this is it works just like the other thing that's going to do the bounce light i'll show you, you just basically scale it to cover the space you want um, and it'll start reflecting the stuff around there. So that's the only, and then it just goes off your shader, which I'm using a mask to only make this part of the street look wet. Um, turn on the light again here. But yeah, you can kind of see how it's reflecting everything around there, which is cool. You know? And yeah, then it's really cool. as you, you know, you can, the amount of it is basically whether you, when you drag it up and down to show whether it's real sharp or light. So. So yeah, I'm not sure if there's a more advanced one they're talking about or if that's what they meant, but that comes native to Blender, which is cool too. That's awesome. basically it has these light probe effects, which is that it has a reflection plane, a reflection cube map, which I would assume is kind of like that, but maybe for a more 3D space, like different planes. And then the radiance volume, which is this thing. Um, if I go back to here, so. Yeah, that. All right, so. Oops, sorry. The wrong one. All right. So I have the radius volume, which is around the Raman bars. There's no, oh, sorry, one last thing. Turn off these lights. There's no lights here, but if you go under your EV settings here, once you have this box set up and you go under <coughs> um, screen space, whoops, sorry, it's the uh, indirect lighting, sorry. And you bake the cube map here, and you'll see now with everything dark under here you can't see a thing but i have like these glowing um tube lights and stuff like that now let's see what happens if i bake the cube map there you go yeah so now it has all this kind of lighting that's already set up for you in there that wasn't there before, awesome you know? and you know if you wanted to add some more bright things out here it would light them up more too so like if i had let's see if i create a um I think if I just create a cube here, let's bring it here and make it a, um, 
give it a really bright emission shader, it might light them. It's not always the most accurate, but it doesn't matter for you know non-photo real rendering either. So but yeah, if I make this like a real bright light there and then bring out this radiance volume, I'll scale it a little bit more out. And then run it again. Yeah, not so much for them, I guess. It's blowing on the table here, but not on the cards, so it's lighting that up. But um, And also, if you go here, oops, sorry, grab it here. I'll drag it like to the middle of the street here, for example, and I'll scale it up really huge, like just to take up the whole city, the whole town, and I'll run it in there. And you can even do like not just the cube map, just all the indirect lighting in the scene and run it. Yeah, so you can see now it's got like this nice lighting all through the streets. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's like that light coming out of there wasn't there. You know, so right. no lights on in the scene right now. So you didn't have to go set all that up manually. Yeah, yeah, and then it's just there, and it's also easier on the scene. And if you don't like it, you can just delete it again. You know, and just you could um, you know, depending on this the heaviness and the scale of your cube map is how strong it'll be too. Like you can uh, bring it down a little bit. And there's settings for it too, which I've just barely been delving into to get different effects out of it too. Like it has the smoothing, your cube map size, the diffuse bounces. You know, you can get into all that stuff, and it can get a lot more accuracy for you. Um, but I, you know, I tend to just work dirty and work, use the uh, the most basic setup for it all. So you kind of see it processing it here. But yeah, and that one now has like a little bit of glow from these lights. These aren't actually mm -hmm. lights. These are just a shader, and it's lighting this front door now and the sidewalk. So it's nice. a nice addition. And then once you go in here and you turn your regular lights back on, it keeps that, and it just becomes a nice combo of the two. So yeah, I just oh yeah, a little more. And you still have like that little beam coming out the door and stuff. So mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's cool. That's cool stuff. So yeah, and you can do that with all your neon signs and yeah, it'll make all these glows against, you know, there's no lights up here, but you can see it sort of, you know, glowing against the wall with your fake signs. So if you want to make your Tokyo or, you know, Hong Kong metropolis with all the signs, which is the stuff I like. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, so anything else specific that's uh, come up before? Oh, we've got an anima animation related question. Um, yeah. So uh, they're curious about, you know, how did the Roco mocap suit help your animation process? And then they expanded mm. on their question just a little bit. Said, so, like, do you recommend using a mocap suit to replace traditional animation completely, or is it best purposed for specific cases? You, I mean, depending on the style of animation you want, it could replace animation completely. Like, um, mm -hmm. here, I, I do have time. I can show you a quick setup. I'll just apply it straight mocap, and I'll show you what it looks mm -hmm. like. Um, let me just go to open up my. I'll bring up Steve McQueen character. Yeah, which I had a yeah. couple of requests to, to see this. So, really cool that you're showing Okay, it. cool. Yeah. yeah, the thing that's cool about the Rococo mocap is the Rococo comes with its own studio, which cleans up the motion capture for you really well and really nicely. And then when it's done, uh, it's partly why I use AutoRig Pro is it has its own retargeting plugin. But Rococo has one too you can set up. It's just AutoRig Pro already had it. I like the rig um, for you know straight animation as well. And it already has a preset for Rococo built into it too. So I have this AutoRig Pro thing here. And if you go down here, um, it has the, uh, oops, back over to rig here. It has this remap feature. It's usually minimized. But when you open AutoRig Pro, it has remap here. And so what you do is when you're in Rococo Studio, you can uh, export your character. Like I'll show you here. This is the mocap I got in there. So this was the, um, I have a render of this on my Facebook and stuff too on YouTube if you want to check it. But this is how it looks in Rococo. So these are some of the filters you do. You can go through and like you can kind of see where his feet, like the main thing you have to do is like you have to clean up where his feet are touching because that's kind of how the suit works. And once you have that, it'll actually clean up a lot of the mocap for you automatically. You just run these filters. 
And uh, once you're done, so this is what you're seeing live when you're wearing the suit, which is cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can you can just hit record and watch yourself do it. And when you're done, you clean it up real quick and export an FBX of it. And you can do it whatever frame rate you want. And when you get that, you bring it in, you bring the FBX in here. So if I bring in the FBX and go to the mocap, I have. How cool is it that you're doing all of this as <laughs> I just know. one one person I know, that's, <laughs> on a workstation. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing what technology allows now. So um, one quick thing, I got to re-import it. Um, there's a couple little particular things with um, Blender when you bring stuff in. Like you got to do automatic bone orientation when you bring in your FBX. So it'll come in so it doesn't get all jumbled. So there you go. You can see the little mocap dude. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, my Starlight guy. It's an older model, so he's like a huge scale. He's like way over scaled. So, but I just got to bring him down so he's generally in the same, about the same scale, and you're fine. So what I do is to use the retargeter. Um, bring this up here. Show us the timeline down here so you can see what's going on. All right. So you can see, you know, that's the mocap in there on that skeleton I brought in. So it's ready to go. I just pick that and I pick it as the source armature here. So I just pick it there. And what you do is you just got to freeze it. It's just like an automated thing it does. And then after that, you pick the target armature. So I pick this guy, which is my Duke McQueen guy, and pick that. So you've got your source and your target ready to go. And then you can do an auto scale, which will sort of try to set the scale right. Because you, it's basically working, especially for like the hips, it's using translation and rotation. So you want to try to keep it in the same sort of world space so that, you know, when it's taking the translation from the, the skeleton, he's not squatting too low on this one to match it, you know. So, but you don't have to get super close, just in the general area. And... Um, so I usually just do it by eye. I don't auto scale usually makes it a little too small for me. But what you do is you build a bones list, which is just temporary. Um, it's basically trying to read both rigs and find the bones and try to match them up by names. You can actually name bones a certain way to have them automatically match up too. Auto rig pro doesn't do that, but um, it has a preset for that. But before you do it, you just go down and say redefine rest pose, which will set your mocap skeleton here and all you got to do is you're just doing a little additional setup to match your starting pose of the other character the t pose and mine are more in an a pose mm -hmm. so all i do is just pick these two arm joints on either side and say copy the rotation and then you can kind of see how it lined it up there and then i apply it and then that's it and then after that i just go to my mapping preset which i have you can make your own from the bones list when you're done, but this one comes with the one already for Rococo with IK legs. I accept it. I import it. And um, it's hard to see, but it updated this whole bones list here. Um, and it's good to go. So once you have that, you literally just go to retarget here. And you have your own space down here. You can see how long it is. It's about 500 frames. Um, so I'll set my animation there, 500. But yeah, you just go to retarget. It, it lets you pick the frame range there and just say OK and just wait a minute or so. It's pretty quick. There you, there you go. And now it's good to go. So and then the only thing you have to do is if they're, you know, this is the same thing with world space and proportions are a little different. So you can see his arms a little tucked to his side. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you go here, like this arm's a little tucked to the left there, so you can go to left arm here and pick it here, and what it has is these features called interactive tweaks, which is just a little plus and minus for the rotation. So if you pick your left arm, which is this, you can just add a little rotation, like oops, in the x-axis to bring it out. So now you have that, and it's, an, it's a global adjustment. So now his arm looks okay for all of them. And then I don't have any hand mocap, so you'll have to go and keyframe your hand to be squeezing it on your own. Um, and then same with the right arm. You know, it's a little tucked, but pick your right arm there. Oops. And same thing, you can kind of just bring it out there. And then, you know, he's looking pretty natural here. And same thing if his waist is going a little low, you could pick his, his hips and, you know, move it up. 
and down in screen space a little bit. You know, if he's standing a little too high or his knees are popping, just bring it down, and it's all global. And the that's thing that's great. great is once you have all this, you could just pick it all. Oops. Yeah, just pick his whole character, and it has all these. Make a graph editor here. You have all this stuff, but you can basically pick all these keyframes and go under, oops, go to pose, animation, bake action, and you could bake it on, say, let's say three so it's easier to see. So I'll just pose, I'll just do that, and now it's going to bake the animation on every three frames instead of every frame like the original motion guy. So this is like one step I do to make it look like it's like the Spider-Verse sort of stepped animation. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So, and once you have that, um, and that you, if you zoom in here, and now you can kind of see, like it's 229, then it left two blank, then 32, and you, if you zoom in here, you can see the curves are sort of blending between the two, mm -hmm. but with all your it's sort of hard to see with the how it dragged out, but if you just say A and select all, you go under key, and you do your interpolation mode, which is constant, which will make it like stepped. There you go. So now there won't be any transition from key to key. It'll just pop from each one. Mm -hmm. And so, and now you have your Spider-Verse type animation, and it's all kind of steppy like that. So, and then, you know, you can turn on your textures here. Nice. Yeah. And you can add your... Oops. Sorry, you can... Darken your background. Add a light here. And get it all dramatic looking, you know. There. Oops, I'm in pose mode. Yeah, you can add your light here. Point light. There you go. Get them lit a little better. Now he's got some dramatic lighting. Now he's just going through checking things out, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, so yeah, and then it's you know, I I actually have the gloves now too, but yeah, he can be going around too. And so yeah, if people are curious. I uh, I wanted to show it for this too, and even for the most suit, but I just got the gloves yesterday. But if you want to see what they look like, like the suit is actually. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. So this is the suit. That's how it looks. And it's pretty form-fitting and sexy. It looks like a water suit from Dune. Nice. <laughs> um, and then they got the gloves here, which I'm excited to play with this weekend. And they come in this case here. And um, this is basically all they are. It's just this, it looks like a nice little leather glove. And the way this whole suit works is it's all these little magnetic sensors, like in the fingertips. Let me know if you can't see this stuff. Um, yeah, I can see it a bit. Okay, just gonna, so I can see what I'm showing on camera, yeah. So it has a sensor here, and it has like a main one here. And the same thing with the whole body suit. It has sensors on like the forearm, the shoulder, and the waist and everything. And they all work magnetically from each other so you don't want to be next to any magnetic surfaces or you don't want to be in a fully metal room or it's going to mess it up but otherwise mm -hmm. that's all you need and all you need is a wi-fi connection and wow you just basically you sync it through wi-fi with a USB-C cable the first time you put the suit on but then after that it always just works and when you open rococo studio um, with this here all you'll do is sync it up and um you know, he just you plug in you have to use a little portable battery to run the suit but i mean you can get one for 20 bucks and it runs the suit for like 15 hours you know so mm -hmm. and it basically just works like this you can see like i'll show you in the mocap you can see my motion capture of when i start so i just i hit record on my keyboard there and then i step away <laughs> take a step back <laughs> and i start doing my pose you know so yeah you don't need any cameras or sensors or anything like those mocap suits with the balls and um, right. or cameras and things like that. It's just all sensors, so you can just great. sit in, in your computer room in front of your computer and just record night, like forever. Like last night, I recorded this mocap, I cleaned it up and imported it to my character to match it a little bit, and it 
you know, I actually recorded two other scenes too of this guy punching a guy and a guy getting punched, and it all took, you know, not even forty five minutes to do everything, including the cleanup. So wow, okay, um, yeah. So it's pretty, you know. And then when it comes out, you know, you have you end up with this thing. So <laughs> awesome. And, you know, one last quick thing I'll show you, which I just discovered last night, which is great about Blender, if you really want to get crazy, is they now have an iPhone virtual camera that you can use. Oh, yeah, I've heard about this. Yes. Yeah, so, and it's pretty much plug and play. So I don't think it'll take any time to use it here. I just open up the app. And what it does is it has this virtual camera. You start serving. It shows you this QR code, which you'll connect in the app to your phone. And once it's done, it opens up. It'll show you which camera in the app to choose, and then you just hit link. Oh, I have to move it around to calibrate it. Give me one sec. Ready to go. Oh, I have to look through the camera. There we go. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> look at that. That's awesome. So, yeah, you can kind of, I started kind of far away, but you can see, you know, you can, hey, and the thing that's cool is while you have it moving around, you can just hit play and it'll give you like a little countdown and it'll start moving through the scene as he's shooting. And you can even have it look through the, um, if you don't want to look on your screen while you're moving it around, you can even show it on here. So you can kind of see there, it's showing my scene there. Wow. And so it's basically showing what my uh, Blender viewport is showing. It's a super easy way to animate your camera. Yeah, so I mean, like last night, it was the first time I ever used it. Um, I plugged it in the first time, and I just recorded this, and I barely did any cleanup on it. You know, I mean, it could be a little cleaner move for composition and stuff. Yeah, look, but yeah, but look at I that. Just, yeah, I just plugged in the mocap and then held the camera in front of it. I had it looking through a little viewport, and I was done. I barely did any cleanup. I just did one little cleanup to smooth the curves when he like completely flew out of frame because I almost yeah. dropped the phone, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, to get this, you know, I, when your character's ready and rigged like this, you can just put this whole scene together in less than an hour. That's like, this would have been a week's worth of work with traditional animation, you yeah. know? <laughs> like with the, with the animation, the cleanup, getting the camera animated and smoothed out, you know? So you've just saved yourself days of work. It's crazy. So I take it you're going to use this approach for working out some of your shots and scenes for... Uh... The last for secret sure. man. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Super I mean, cool. it's a little limited because you're you you have your space. You can't really like circle around someone. But yeah, like just for like fights and stuff like that. You know, like, where you just. I know some some stuff. of those tight shots, right? Like you, getting that tight shot on a character, like you can really get a lot more nuance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To what's going on? That's rad. Well, this this is a this was a great high point. Um, I think to, yeah. to finish on, we're we're about at time. Uh, this is just really cool yeah. to see all of it come together like this. Look at yeah. that. I hope I covered enough stuff for everyone to see. I mean, there's lots more. Oh, yeah. Too, we covered but, um, a lot of ground. No, yeah. I, that's, I think that's what's so fun about featuring um, your project is you're really, you're not just, I'm doing this one particular discipline, but because you have a 3D generalist skill set, you're able to utilize all of that in Blender. Yeah. And you're just, you're able to show us all these different disciplines of how you're approaching the project yeah. and then proving that Blender's, you know, a great tool for kind of a one person operation. Yeah. It's so exciting because it's, it is so versatile and so easy to just get so many styles in all yourself to get it in there without too much work. You know, I mean, yeah. I got a little technical with like with the bones and things like that, but that's stuff you could learn. If you're looking for something specific like that, working on your project, you can look up that specific thing and learn it in an hour on a YouTube video, and then you're off to yeah. the races, you know. So. Oh, did you have any tips on uh, like a particular channel or some some place to go where you've done a lot oh, of yeah. learning at? Um, there's oh man, there's a lot of guys. I should have written a list. I'll tell you who the god is, which most people probably know is Ian Hubert. I mean, a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. I said today is just regurg regurgitated okay. Ian Hubert stuff. Okay. Um, and he is like the master. Um, but man, I'm on the spot now. So of course I'm forgetting everyone's names, but I'll say this. If you follow my, um, if you go to my art station, it has all my social media links on there too, but there's a lot of people on Twitter that are always showing stuff okay. and same yeah. with YouTube. And I, I tend to share a lot of their stuff on there, especially with like procedural, uh, non photo real shaders. You know, I think there's CG cookie is one of the people I follow a lot. 
Is he the okay. guy who makes all the donuts? <laughs> There's one guy who does the original donut tutorial that everyone does, and he's really amazing. There's oh, a guy yeah, named... Blender, Blender Guru is awesome, yeah. Oh, Blender Guru, that's how I was yeah. thinking of. Yeah, yeah, he's another one. So those are kind of the main ones that I do, like those three. Mm -hmm. Um and then, yeah, then the other ones, there's a lot of ones I just have saved that are just like individual ones I've found just for specific tasks. Like there's a lot of people out there that are that are great for people like me and this style. They're learning how to recreate uh, Ghibli, Studio Ghibli effects. Like I've seen some of that. Creators. It's so cool. Yeah. And it's really good. And it's I've made a couple tests with it, and they're really light in your scenes too. So you can use them in your scenes without having to have some crazy high-end you know, like you know, paint a thing, you know, you can, totally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, cause a lot of it's done procedurally and it's mm -hmm. done really in a really cool way. So uh, our, would you, do you mind if uh, my colleague drops your um, art station link? Yeah. In the chat? Yeah. Um, you can drop my art, my art station. My um, Twitter is J underscore naked. It's in a Y K I D. Mm -hmm. Most of those you can find all my other social media on it. Like I have my Facebook page. I post a lot. Um, I've been posting most Blender stuff on Twitter lately, even though I haven't always been a huge Twitter fan, but there's so many Blender people on there, I can't mm -hmm. stay away. So most yeah. of Twitter is just me. There's occasional posts from me and then just me retweeting all kinds of stuff. So, But I'm also, like, I'm really enjoying streaming about this and talking about it and showing the process. So what I'm going to be doing now, too, is I'm going to start streaming, you know, semi-irregularly and I'll start doing it more regularly down the road, but I want to just start streaming my process as I work on shots, mm -hmm. um, probably on YouTube and Twitch, um, just like this. So oh, yeah. uh, if you follow That'd my be Twitter, awesome. if I, like, I'm going to start doing it maybe once a week or once every couple weeks on a weekend for a couple hours and see how it goes. And people can kind of come in and ask questions and see me working on a scene. And I'm happy to show specific stuff too if they want to ask, or they can just watch me work on stuff while I listen to some okay, cool. music or something, you know. But yeah. you know, I want to get a little used to it, and then I might start doing like a regular timed weekly thing too, just to kind of go through the whole process of making this whole short as I, you know, get deeper and deeper into it until it's finished. Very um, cool. So yeah, just follow my Twitter there, and you'll kind of get the announcements, and you can, uh, you know, find out if you want. You, know, you can ask more questions when we have more time again to talk awesome. about it again, and then. You know, anytime. Yeah, and definitely, anything. definitely follow Jason guys to kind of see how uh, the last Secret Agent Man develops. I think your your goal is you'd like to be able to finish the project by the end of the year. Um, yeah. So be be cool to just keep keep following you and keep watching you to see how this thing grows. Cool. Yeah, it's an exciting time now because now I have all the mocap working and I have the cameras and stuff. So now I've sort of figured out all the technical hurdles and now mm -hmm. I'm just ready to start producing shots like crazy. So that's kind of <laughs> nice. why I want to start streaming it too because you won't be watching me figure out how to get a shader to work or how to uh, get this finger right. to work on the rig for yeah, like three this is hours. the more exciting like, stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah so, awesome. Um, Very cool. Cool. Um, well, Jason, thank you so much. It, yeah, it, and this was like this was an even deeper dive than we got to do the last time. I feel like we're yeah. able to 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 do the project uh, more justice and and get a little bit more into the nitty gritty, which I know that a lot of our viewers really appreciated too. So yeah, it's been awesome. Thanks. Yeah, and also one more thing about YouTube too is I the sort of the hand drawing texture on the character I have, and also mm -hmm. the rigging the two D cards of people. I've recorded both of those on my own time too, I'm just editing too, and I'm gonna throw those up on YouTube as well. So you can kind of see a more detailed, like specific tutorial on how to do it too, instead of a just rush through version here as well. Okay, so, cool. But yeah, thanks for having me. This was great. And I oh yeah, it. our I'm pleasure. Listen, I, I love sharing the uh, Blender excitement with everyone, with people who don't get tired of hearing me talk about Blender all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, like my good. Maya using well, I'll tell you what, like we, uh, you know, any, I think anytime you're doing something related to 3D, I know a lot on a lot of the Noman streams will get Blender related questions. And so it's been awesome to be able to, while Noman doesn't necessarily teach Blender in its curriculum because we've we've got to make time for what's most widely used in studios, uh, yeah. we really do like Blender and Blender's awesome. So it's been great to feature artists such as yourself uh, to really highlight what Blender can do. 
Yeah, Blender's originally got really big with concept artists too, and mm -hmm. it's, it is just really good and flexible for individuals and small teams to do stuff like this and get their ideas out. So it has some little technical things that might keep it from the big studios right now, but those are so close to being solved too, you know, things like referencing and some of the animation tools. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, I mean, it's just as strong as the other software, and like it's only a matter of time before it catches up on all that. So, but yeah, I, so I think a lot of a lot more places are going to start start using it too. Like uh, Ian Huber, for example, he um, did a visual effects for a movie called Prospect, which is a really cool sci-fi movie. I, I love that movie. Yeah. He did all the effects in that in Blender. He's been using Blender oh, great. For, for like 15 years. It's crazy. So he's awesome. a good, if you want like real, like realistic visual effects, he's a good guy to watch too and see how he does it. Cause he works fast like me, but he's doing like photo real textures and realistic stuff that looks amazing, you know, which I, I can't even get close to that. So <laughs> awesome. Uh, it's cool stuff. Cool. Well, Jason, thanks. Um, and yeah. thanks everybody for, for coming in on the stream and spending the yeah. evening with us. And, uh, Hope to see all of you back here again soon. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, stay safe, stay creative, and uh, we'll see you see you on stream again soon. Yeah, thanks. Thanks right. for hanging out with me, Adam. <laughs> Absolutely, my pleasure, man.